Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Edward Summit podcast. It's been a little bit. Uh, I think uh, last time we did a podcast uh, for the Edward Summit podcast, Joe and I were taking a look at a few of uh, one of Ed's short stories, one of his magazine articles, and that was back in November. So here we are in late February. Apologies for the little delay if this is something <laughs> that appeals to you. But uh, I'm especially, especially excited today to be with uh, back with Joe Blevins, as well as Jim Pontalillo. And uh, I proposed, uh, based on a, a, a text that uh, Jim had supplied me, I proposed to these two guys that maybe we talk about it. Unbeknownst to me at that particular moment, uh, it was it's it is Black History Month right now, and yes. uh, you'll you'll see how that becomes relevant uh, <laughs> as as Jim sets the sets the stage for this conversation momentarily. So, uh, super quick intro. I I do write uh, for Joe's wonderful Dead Rights uh, blog, the Edward Wednesdays section, which is now in its tenth year. Is that right, Joe? That's right. It's going to turn ten years old in uh, 2023. So this was supposed to last, I think, two months. That was the original plan. Was that it was going to be two months, and it's gone ten years. And as this show that we're about to do will demonstrate, we are nowhere near covering everything with because there's so much. And thanks to Jim, uh, we have some more because he found a very interesting book and scanned it. Uh, so that we could uh, go over it. And uh, Jim, I think you've prepared some introductory remarks about this very incredible book. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me just get this. Here's the book for discussion today, Black Myth by Dick Trent with Dr. T.K. Peters. Uh, I'm going to put this down now and pardon me while I look off stage left at some prepared notes to keep myself on track. Um, just an intro to the book for anyone who hasn't seen it, which would undoubtedly be virtually everyone else watching this. Uh, so the book's by Dick Trent, or Edward D. Wood Jr., with Dr. T.K. Peters, published in 1971 by Sex Press of Los Angeles. Um, depending on the time period when you look, the Sex, S-E-C-S, stands for Sex Education Clinical Series or Sexual Education Correspondence School. The book's 192 pages long. It's volume 22 of the 34 volume Encyclopedia of Sex that Sex Press put out. Um, a blurb on the black back cover reads, a detailed analysis of the sexual and sociological misinformation surrounding black sexuality. Um, consists of an introduction, five chapters, an epilogue, a bibliography. The text is accompanied by 16 full color and 84 black and white hardcore pornographic photos that are often quite oddly captioned. Um, let's look at the two authors briefly. Dr. T.K. Peters, or Dr. Thomas Kimwood Peters, was a pioneer American motion picture producer, newsreel cameraman, photographer, educator, and inventor. Um, previous Edward Summit podcasts, numbers four and five, uh, provided a detailed look at the life of Dr. Peters. For several decades at least, Peters conducted studies in human sexuality, which ultimately resulted in a lengthy manuscript on the subject. In his waning years, Peters moved to Los Angeles, after which he sold his sexual magnum opus to Bernie Bloom's Pendulum Publishers. It's doubtful that Peters could have imagined the fate that awaited his <laughs> beloved manuscript. Bloom had his staff writers mine Dr. Peters' texts to varying degrees, add in their own written contributions, and then a healthy dollop of explicit pornographic photos was stirred into the mix. The end result was a tsunami of at least 64 pornographic paperbacks bearing the T.K. Peters name that were churned out for the enlightenment of one-handed readers across North America. <laughs> Edward Jr.'s co-authorship of this book under the pseudonym of Dick Trent has never been questioned. He listed Black Myth in his resume. It was assigned to him in the 1971 edition of the US Library of Congress catalog of copyrights and a review of the writing style fully supports the claim. In my experience, this is among one of the rarest of the sex press encyclopedia of sex books. I've seen three copies show up in about the last 15 years online. Its original cover price in 1971 was $4.95, which is the equivalent of $36 in 2022. 
Um, I lucked out and paid $70 for my copy. The only current, the only copy currently available online is at Advanced Book Exchange for the asking price of $225. Um, Black Myth needs to be examined in light of an earlier sex press publication, Black Sexual Habits by Dr. T.K. Peters and Jan Fowler from a year earlier, 1970. Finally, in 1971, Sex Press published a digest-sized magazine, The Adult Garden of Sex, Book Two. Um, it includes a 15-page article entitled Myths About Black Sexuality. I haven't seen it, but presumably that that text was drawn from one of these two books. So that's a little introduction to the black myth. Um, Greg, if you like, I could talk about how the evidence that it's derived from black sexual habits from a year earlier, if you'd like. Please, Jim, you're covering a lot of ground here. Keep going. Oh, okay, so for, published one year earlier by the same press, we have Black Sexual Habits and Techniques uh, by Dr. T.K. Fowler and, oh, excuse me, by Dr. T.K. Peters with Jan Fowler. Um, Jan Fowler, if the Library of Congress copyrights are to be believed, was the author Hal Cantor, who contributed to lots of sex books in the era. Um, slightly shorter than Black Myth, it comes in at 160 pages, consisting of an introduction, a preface, 12 short chapters, and, and conclusions. It has less a smaller number of photos, eight full color and 56 black and white pornographic photos captioned in the same weird pendulum style as you'll see a year later in Black Myth. Um, some of the photos from Black sexual habits are reproduced in Black Myth, but, but only a handful. Um, in physical presentation, Black sexual habits and Black Myth look pretty much the same. And you would be excused for thinking that black sexual habits was part of the encyclopedia of sex, but it's not. Um, it seems that uh, sex press slash pendulum in 69 came upon this sort of house style and, and carried it forward for many books. Um, so, Let's talk about black sexual habits. It, it lays out the black myth as follows. Blacks are extremely oversexed and indiscriminate in their choice of partners and sexual acts. This is doubly so of black men who are also inordin inordinately endowed in the penile size department compared to white men. So that is the black myth that Dr. Peters lays out in this book and he purports to examine. Um, I have to say there is a night and day difference between these two books. Uh, Black Sexual Habits, the earlier book, reads largely like a professional study marshalling socioeconomic and historical data of the day and from earlier times from professionals to support its points. Uh, I can only conclude from reading it that it is over, overwhelmingly, I would say probably 75% Peter's original uh, manuscript on human, from Peter's original manuscript on human sexuality, lightly altered by uh, Hal Cantor, importing some material largely from other pendulum uh, sex works to spice up the manuscript a bit here and there. Um, and the bibliography for Black sexual habits uh, reflects this. Um, of almost 20 sources, 14 of them are actually professional uh, studies of some sort, and only five are references to the recent porn literature. Uh, by contrast, well, well, we'll talk about the, the Black myth references in a bit. Um, it's clear from looking at the two that in writing Black Myth, 
Ed used black sexual habits for inspiration. In some cases, he copied large sections of text entirely. I would hesitate to cause that, call that plagiarism because that was largely just sort of the house style at Pendulum to borrow chunks of text from book to book, regardless of what the authorship might be. Um, so Ed, in some cases, took entire pieces of text and transported them unchanged. In other cases, he took, he took ideas from Peters and pulled them through a woody and filter, often getting a completely opposite conclusion than Peters reached in his, in his own book. Um, you know, in looking at the two books side by side, again, like I said, you know, Black Sexual Habits, the first book, reads largely like a straight book on sociology. Um, Ed's Black Myth is just this really confused um, translation and, and retelling of some of its contexts. Now, one of the things that's immediately striking when you look at the two table of contents side by side is that the Peters book started off, starts off with a series of chapters on things like promiscuity, homosexuality, da, 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 da. he marches through several of those, and then the, and that's about half of the chapters, and then the latter half of the chapters are ha, are these paired chapters. So it's chapter titles like black man, white woman, white man, black woman, and so forth. Um, Ed's black myth, the entire structure is that latter half of Peter's structure, except Ed mixes it up a bit. But you, can, you again, you, from there, you can clearly see how Ed was modeling his book after at least part of the Peter's book. Um, let me see what other comments I wanted to make in comparison. So, you know, I'll, I'll bring up one point to, to contrast the difference between the two approaches and the two completely different fields. Um, Peters talks about sexual relations in the antebellum South. And he talks about that there probably were wealthy white women sitting in their mansion at night vaguely or, or and perhaps not so vaguely entertaining ideas of sex with some of the black slaves but of course they would have very few of them would have ever considered it because of all the the possible extremely negative social ramifications that could come about if that were ever known um ed takes that idea from peters and he relates it as this sort of fever dream sexual fantasy of the woman running down from the big house across the fields, throwing herself down in the mud in front of the slave's hut and flailing about waiting to be mounted. And, and, and that is really, I think for me, that was sort of the prime uh, example as I read through the two texts side by side of the difference between the approaches that uh, you, you had the, the very staged sociological study produced by Peters, and then you had Ed mining that and just running with it to all sorts of different, all sorts of different ends. Um, another example I would cite is that, you know, Peters discussed how, now I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Put some quotes about this. Um, Peters is talking about the knowledge of the day. That, you know, could have been very inaccurate, right? I just want to put that up front. So Peters talks at one point about a black aversion to oral sex, that it was something uncommon to the community, but that it became more common in the community after they had more exposure to white people. Right. This is one of the things that Peters talks about. Ed takes that and transforms it into a complete lack of knowledge of oral sex among blacks until they are sort of instructed 
at duress, under duress by whites into the practice. So, uh, you know, again, it's Ed latching onto this generalized idea that Peter had, Peter's had and transforming it into something completely different that, that you cannot find in the Peter's text at all. He, he does not go anywhere near that kind. You can't even read that kind of an inference from, from what he wrote originally. It's truly in sort of an Ed, it's been pulled through the wood filter, um, if you will. <laughs> Um, let me see what other comparative notes I want to make. You know, I have to say in reading Black Myth, the second book, it's one of the least grounded books of the Encyclopedia of Sex series that I've seen. Many of them are off, many of them are often much more like black sexual habits in that they read largely like sociological studies that have had bits of stuff pulled into them to spice them up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, Black myth is just really out there. I mean, it's, it's a lot of Ed un, unfettered, running free and wild. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's my gen, that would be my general, um, opening remarks. The only thing I would say is that, so Ed, as opposed to blacks, you know, black sexual habits, like I said, about two thirds of the sources or more are from established literature of the day. Um, at least half or about 60% of Ed's references are actually to the smut literature of his day. So some of the wild stuff that's in, and, and these are rare books we're talking about that I have not seen yet. So we, some of the wilder ideas in Black Myth, we can't really be sure until we see those books, whether they were Ed's ideas or whether it was maybe some wild ideas he was pulling from some of the other early 70s, you know, late 60s, early 70s sources. Hard to say. I and mean, we can't say, right? Um, and that's sort of the that's sort of the general notes I would make. I don't want to say you know I've got some more specific points to make on some particular issues, but I, I'd say that's the sort of the comparison of the two books. That's that's beautiful, Jim. That's a great uh, great framework for the conversation and uh, very erudite. Uh, that may be the most erudite uh, opening we've ever had here at the Edward Summit podcast. So now we're going to go off <laughs> off onto some <laughs> tangential roads. I do want to say right up front. Uh, we're aware, obviously, this is a sensitive subject and we want to treat it with appropriate sensitivity. Obviously, there are words in this book. Ed normally puts them in quotes that we're not going to say here on mm -hmm. a YouTube podcast. Uh, but uh, Joe's chomping at the bit, too. I know all of us are going to be uh, exploding here in a, in a moment with all kinds of ideas. Well, the only other thing I'll, I'll throw it right over to you, Joe. The only other thing I want to say is, uh, well, I don't even want to go there. I may... I, I, I've smoked on occasion on the Edward Summit podcast previously. I think this one's going to drive me to light a cigarette. So I want to let you kids out there know if you haven't uh, started, don't. And if you have started, please quit. Don't role model off it. It's not a healthy thing to do. Go ahead, Joe. I was going to say this is a very odd book to be covering in the month of February during uh, <laughs> Black History Month. There is some Black history in it. Um, not long ago, I, I reviewed an article that Ed wrote for a, a magazine called Black and White. Uh, called, uh, is it really so important about race relations? And I mentioned in my review that he doesn't mention Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. Both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are name checked in this book, although I'm sure they would rather not have been. Um, <laughs> he was talking about the, the terminology. Obviously, the N word is used several times, but more often, even than the M, the N word is used, uh, is a uh, is a slur that I you don't hear much outside of you know Civil War times. Uh, I guess uh, I don't even know if I, I want to spell out the word or or, or anything. Uh, it's the D uh, word. Uh, you hear that in I guess I've seen it in uh, old. Uh, you know, minstrel shows and, and things like that and, and old cartoons and things. 
but uh, I, Ed sort of uses it just uh, uh, commonly. Like he, he'll just be talking about, um, he'll just be talking about, about black people and he'll use that term uh, occasionally. And that took me a little bit uh, by surprise. There is some really virulent stuff in this uh, book. Um, if by some chance you should ever come across a copy of Black Myth, uh, there is stuff that will definitely offend you as a human being, as a thinking, feeling human being. There is stuff that will offend you. And yet when he gets to the epilogue, suddenly, you know, it's the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, it's it's very, very formal. The, this book is not meant to, uh, you know, slander any race or religion. And uh, well, you could have fooled me in some of the, the chapters. There is in particular, there is in particular a passage about uh, sex in uh, bathrooms or toilet rooms uh, that I, I was completely uh, shocked uh, by. Um, the, the book, we were talking about this before we, we started recording, uh, about the experience of reading a book like Black Myth. I said it was like having your head held underwater. Uh, it, it, I felt like every couple of paragraphs I had to... <gasps> you know, I had to breathe again. I could, I could, it, this is such a densely written book. Um, there's long rambling uh, passages in it that make very, very little sense. I would read through them two or three times. Uh, James talked about uh, some of the, uh, of Ed Wood's uh, stylistic quirks, uh, which are all over this book. The, uh, you know, uh, specifically the ellipses, dot, dot, dot. That's probably the most famous hallmark of Ed's, of Ed's writing. Um, he'll just have long rambling sentences uh, that are connected with these ellipses, uh, long rambling paragraphs, uh, where he'll seem to have one idea by the uh, beginning of the paragraph and a, a completely different idea by the end of it. Uh, I don't know if, you know, the central, uh, the central thesis of this book is, is, you know, is this black sexual potency, is this a myth or is it, is it not? And Ed reaches both conclusions uh, frequently uh, throughout this book, so um, it's in a weird way. It's a it's a tough read. Uh, it was a tough read for me, anyway. Uh, I, I made my way through this twice, and at first I was I was trying to take notes uh, because of possibly of the of the the TK Peters source material. Ed is uh, constantly citing uh, other books, uh, sometimes scholarly books, sometimes smut books. Uh, historical figures like Dr. Irving Bieber, whom I found out because of this book, uh, Havelock Ellis is mentioned. Um, we'll talk about Father Divine. Uh, for a while, I was I was trying to take notes on this thing, but it's like trying to take notes on something that an alcoholic is telling you. It's like sitting down next to an alcoholic and just asking him to expound at length on race relations. And Ed just free Ed just free associates from there, and so after a while, I threw away the notes. I was like, <laughs> and uh, all through the process of, of uh, getting through this book, I would occasionally post little uh, excerpts of it uh, from to Twitter, and say, "You'll never guess what this book is about based on this paragraph," because Ed just, you know, he just. Um, Again, free associates. The thing that I, the thing that made it readable for me is comparing it to the narration from Glenn or Glenda. Uh, the the character of Doctor Alton, played by Timothy Farrell in that film, is the designated expert on medicine and science, and he will talk supposedly from a knowledgeable standpoint about this subject. And yet, sometimes if you actually listen to what uh, Dr. Alton is saying in that film, sometimes it's just complete nonsense or just just complete, uh, you know, free associative uh, surrealism, you know, so he, uh, th that's where we get, you know, only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story, you know, um, and that's very much the tone of this book. Uh, he, I think Ed wants to be sound authoritative and uh, serious, but a lot of what he's saying is uh, is complete is complete nonsense, and 
the book is really schizophrenic, I guess, maybe because it's been patched together from different uh, source material and Ed's own thoughts. Uh, the tone changes uh, often. Um, and I didn't, I sometimes I didn't know what to make of it. So, um, Greg, I'd be, I would be curious, what was your, what was your impression of this book when you read it? That's, uh, well, uh, when you said, uh, you know, it feels like uh, I need to, you know, douse my head and, and to a uh, sink full of water. Uh, I had a similar, uh, very similar experience reading the book. In my mind, it was also a symbolic cleansing as well. This this book makes you feel like, I guess, that you need a it symbolic makes cleansing. You feel dirty. <laughs> yeah, because for me, it was, it felt like it, I was having a, you know, a hot vat of uh, boiling water poured over my head constantly as I was reading through it. Um, it is something to offend everyone. I'm very hard to offend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I don't want to say this quite got there for me, but uh, it's some rough stuff. It's some rough stuff, and it is. Uh, you use the word "wild," Jim. This is at, at his at his absolute wildest. So this is not only unique, as you said, within the scope of the T.K. Peters books, but this is unique. I think very unique within the scope of Ed's larger body of work. There's it's mm -hmm. a one of a kind. There's there's literally some of the Pendulum books. Uh, uh, Jim cited, of course, uh, you know the the provenance of this book, another Pendulum book. There were other socio sex paperback uh, um, lines within uh, Pendulum at the time, all very similarly formatted. The Young Marys came okay. out of Pendulum Atlanta as part of the quote unquote Psycho Med series. There was also the Sexual Enlightenment series. T.K. Peters' name does end up slapped on the cover of uh, many, if not the majority of these books. So, quick point on Hal Cantor. Hal Cantor also. Uh, wrote with Ed at Pad Library, which were uh, distributed by oh. Golden State News, GSN, where Ed first worked with Bernie back in the mid 66 through 68-ish time frame. We reviewed Joe and I's Security Risk, which was a Pad Library book, but Hal yeah. Cantor wrote a lot of books for Pad Library as well, as well as, as Jim noted, widely across the spectrum of adult paperbacks at the time, extremely prolific. Also wrote a couple of the books, one of them, the uh, Dracula book that was published by Calga, the oh. sexed up versions published by Calga of, right. of all the classics. That was often attributed previously attributed, attributed to Ed. To you Ed. can go you can go back to Edward Wednesdays way, way back in the yeah, day. We, and uh I I found the copyright. It's actually Hal Cantor. So uh I'm sure he and Ed crossed paths and probably knew of each other's work at very least, if not knew each other and knew each other's work quite well. Well, you mentioned the the formatting. We should talk a little bit about how this book is formatted. Um, Before we run on, can I just touch sure. on a few of your points that you made, both of you? Sure. Um, so, you know, you talk about the Ed style, right? And and one of the one of one of the little snippets that just jumped out at me and screamed Ed was, you know, on page ninety one, the fact of the situation was a reality. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I was like. You know, if, if, if that doesn't scream, Ed, I don't, to me at least, I don't know what would. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't know if it was our very first Ed Wood inaugural podcast, but on one of the early ones, I did in fact show this book. And at the time, that was it. That was at it. the time, I had only briefly looked at it. But my comment was that I said, if you read portions of this to people today i don't know if they would physically assault you or if they would <laughs> laugh uproariously and and it gets to the point of it has all sorts of offensive material in it but it's also said and presented in such an absurd and out there manner mm -hmm. that you can't actually take any of it seriously um i think the peter's book not that I'm saying it necessarily has like lots of offensive things in it, but I think that its presentation, its sort of serious sociological presentation of the thought of the day, or, you know, he's really citing sources from the 1930s to the 1960s. Right. So his presentation of that in a serious manner might be more apt to upset people because it's a series whereas whereas black myth if you actually read into it is just so out of control that it, you know it does become that point of how seriously can you take anything he's saying well, um, so, 
you mentioned some of the experts who are, are cited in this, and and there are experts who are cited whose work has since been discredited or, or whose uh, careers have now been reconsidered. Uh, right. Uh, all these people that he mentions, by the way, I couldn't find one that was a fake. Uh, I couldn't find one fake. Sometimes Ed will just fudge in his, his articles. He'll just fudge some references. He'll he'll make up stuff. But um, this is all real as far as I could find. Yeah. All the people are real. All the books he cites are real. Yes, uh, all the books, all the books cited are real. I, I looked into all the sources. I could, I could, you know, I proved that they existed. Let's put it that way, even though I haven't seen all of them. Um, and, you know, you talked about Ed's usage of some anachronistically arcane terms, right? Like the D term for, yeah. for, for black people. Well, you know, similarly, he uses, you know, he refers to women as milady. When's the last time? Yeah, that, wrote, is a weird, <laughs> that is a weird stylistic touch. But before we move, I, I, I do think people need to know how these books are formatted. Because yeah, they have to know what the experiences of reading these books are. Uh, there, if you open the book up like this, on one page, for, for me, it would be over here, I guess. Um, on one side, you get the text. It's all text. And on the other side, it's all pictures with captions. And then at a couple of points in the book, it's... Um, they're, they'll just do like a like a couple of pages in a row of just pictures with captions, but to me, if you've ever seen those books where they translate Shakespeare's plays into modern English, and then they'll have the 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 Shakespeare side on one side and the modern side on the other side, and then you look back and look like this, that is basically what the experience is of reading this book. And I got to be honest, to get through reading this manuscript, I had to crop the picture in a way so that I wasn't always seeing the pictures because I had to crop the the, the PDF so that I wasn't always looking at the at the full screen uh, because you'd always be seeing um, basically very intimate pictures of people's human anatomy uh, very very up close uh, you know it reminded me of, of John Waters quote that watching hardcore pornography is like watching open heart surgery and that's what this book is a lot like. It is like, you know, you don't want to get that up and up up close with some of these body parts. It's really like, you know, in your face, sometimes quite literally. And so I had to like concentrate on the text. I'd be like, okay. But then I would look at some of the photo captions and they're written in such a stilted Ed Woodian kind of way that I thought, well, I'll have to read the photo captions too because that's some prime Ed stuff. Now, when I saw the Black Sexual uh, Habits book, I, I saw that in just a text only version. And I assume, is it also the the, the dual format with the pictures yeah, yes. and the text? Yeah, it's the exact same format, exact same kinds of photos, exact same kind of captioning. You know, that, okay. you know, the, the class, I mean, I don't know that this is an exact caption, but the classic caption of a pendulum book would be, you know, men often find oral sex pleasurable. <laughs> well, see, again, just as a, a, a Glenn or Glenda has been called a white coder because you're trying to take uh, salacious material and present it in a very clinical and very serious and encyclopedic way, there is, I guess, some attempt here to uh, present this material as educational. In fact, before you even get to the book, there is a, a disclaimer sort of at the beginning of the book uh, saying that uh, the that infamous uh, President's Commission on Pornography, the very controversial report that I believe was commissioned by Lyndon Johnson and then presented to an outraged Richard Nixon uh, a few years later, uh, recommends education about sex because that will... Uh, that will calm our, our urges and it will lessen the need for smut. So by reading books like this one, educational books like Black Myth, uh, we won't have the need for um, we won't have the need for smut because we'll have this, you know, this serious educational work here. So, um, you know, in a way, I, I think um, the, the tradition of the white coders, it kind of obviously exists in films and, and books as well. And maybe it still sort of exists today uh, to some extent uh, you know there's 
there there'll be documentaries i remember th there'd be real sex documentaries on hbo like well you know you're obviously watching it for salacious reasons but if you want to pretend that this is a is this educational or a documentary if that makes you feel better okay obviously people were buying this uh for sexual gratification and i i must say then that uh this book offers if you were uh, if you're buying this for sexual gratification this book offers a little something for everybody because not only does it feature heterosexual uh, sex it features uh lesbian sex and it features uh gay sex uh depicted very very uh, uh, graphically and you know uh you know matter of factly uh so uh, we were talking uh, if we recognized any of the models in it. Uh, I don't know that we do. Uh, one of the guys looked like to me like the guy from Greg's article about uh, Washington, York. Um, and I found myself even when looking at the pictures. Of course, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the backgrounds. I'm looking at like the paintings up on the wall. And there's a there's a few pictures where they're like in front of like a painted backdrop where you can see like it looks like almost like a cartoony mailbox painted on the wall or something. I don't know what that yeah. was supposed to be. And th there's a couple frolicking on a bed uh, with a picture of what looks like Lassie up on the wall. Um, and I wonder, OK, that's somebody's idea of, of eroticism. Have a nice picture of a collie up there on the wall. Um, and I noticed one of the guys had a tattoo that says USN never again. And I found out that this is for people who've gotten out of the Navy and they never want to be in the Navy again. So they get the USN never again tattoo on their arm. And this guy is in uh, several of the pictures. So I would have to wonder, like, if you were, I mean, if you're buying this for pictures of pretty naked girls, um, what what did you think of for you know when you got to the chapters that are uh you know very very gay oriented and had all of this uh a very explicit homosexual material in it um maybe it's you know like any port in a storm like you said you know maybe like it's all good in the hood you know whatever just like anything sexual is 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 of interest so um yeah, it's it's very diverse, I guess, in its it's in the, in the sexuality that it presents. Um, so that that just struck me as unusual because normally Pendulum's magazines uh, they try to cater to one particular audience or another. In some examples, they will cater to one particular fetish or another. Like this is a magazine all about group sex, so the articles will be about group sex. Or this is a magazine all about lingerie, so the articles and the and the photo shoots will just be about lingerie. So normally Bernie Bloom's stuff tends to be uh, marketed to one particular audience. This, I guess, is a book for people whose interest is sex in general and just want anything explicit, gay or straight, that they can find. So well, you, you know, I. I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say, you know, I think 71 to 72 is a real break point when I look at this stuff. 69, 70, 71, it, well, it's, yeah, it's yeah. how you're characterizing it. You know, they're going, they're still going with this ruse of this is educational. <laughs> this, this isn't, this isn't for, you know, salacious entertainment. Right. This is educational material. So the books tend to be rather broad in their content. But then, but, but, because, because this is right after the Supreme Court rulings where it's sort of like, like they're feeling out what they can get away with. And then once it's clear that, um, at, at least from the federal government's perspective, that they're not going to be, you know, they're no longer going to be pursued by the Postal Service for shipping, shipping, shipping stuff interstate and, and things like that. Yeah, there still may be problems at the local level, right? The county prosecutor who doesn't yeah. like stuff showing up on the, the magazine well, shelves that you know really it's like from 72 on that you see this the split you're talking about um of of more specific things like okay we're going to start putting out the magazines right. that just have heterosexual stuff in it because the heterosexual guys are not going to be that appreciative of the last 20 pages of the book being right. they're, they're, man on like, man what are you, action, you know? what are you getting out of those last uh, 20 pages of the book or so uh, maybe just skipping those. I don't know. Um, where would you buy a book like this? Where would you go to buy a book like Black Myth? Where, where in the in back in the day, where would you go? 
you could uh, you could order these uh, via mail order. There's advertisements in a lot of the Pendulum magazines uh, okay. to order them via. To so Jim's point, might, they were considered educational. That was their Trojan horse. They're, they're, and, yeah. and, you know, early adult bookstores in major cities like New York, Chicago, L.A., San Francisco. Um, not sure how much beyond that, but a lot of mail order. Yeah, it was a lot okay. of mail order for sure. So I, it, because, yeah, this would... You, you couldn't get this into a Barnes and Noble today. I mean, today you couldn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, th th this is. Um, well, you know, what's funny is that uh, Ed will there. There are passages, probably the T.K. Peters passages, where it tries to maintain that encyclopedic uh, tone. But then there's parts where Ed just gets uh, completely into the gutter. You know, he just wallows in the muck, basically. Uh, where it gets very, very explicit uh, sexually. Um, a passage that I found incredibly uh, interesting, and if you have the, of the book, uh, maybe you can find it there. Um, it's on page 74. This is about white men with black uh, women. Mm -hmm. And it says, in researching the life stories for black and white sex magazine, we've come across some extremely interesting personal stories. And then he tells a story right. about uh, a, a woman named Tina Kay and a uh, a man named Donald, who he tells us was a uh, uh, taxidermist. I don't know how that helps you sexually if you're trying to trying to stay horny. Oh, boy, nothing gets them hotter than taxidermy. Um, and I had to wonder, like the rest of this that goes on for paragraphs and paragraphs, this reads like a little short story that I know that there is a pendulum magazine called Black and White. Uh, Ed wrote some articles for it. So I wondered what this was. Was this a short story that Ed is repurposing? Because Ed is not above repurposing like stuff that he's written uh, for, for other uh, sources. So um, yeah, I would have no doubt that's what it is. And, and certainly... Yeah, you know, Pen Pendulum published lots of true life accounts mm -hmm. that were just fictional inventions of their house authors. Now, so, so so you can't rely, you know, and and that's the thing. So Ed Ed's, Ed, Ed will cite these. Ed, Ed will cite these accounts <laughs> as if they are evidence backing up a well, thesis. But, well, I it, think but as far as we know, they're all fictional productions. Well, as, I, I was excited by the fact that hidden within this book, we sort of have an Ed Wood short story here. So uh, this is uh, Ed, of course, uh, Ed's short stories and articles have been um, anthologized in books by uh, Bob Blackburn. There's uh, three of them out right now. Um, and the last one was called When the Topic is Sex, and it focuses on, on his nonfiction uh, articles. And one of the hallmarks of the nonfiction article is uh, Ed pretending to interview some non-existent uh, person and writing up their interview as if it's a news story or something. And obviously he's playing both parts. And here, very early in the book, we get an, a taped interview with somebody from Watts, California, and he gives us the date when this was recorded. And this is an example of something that Ed loves to do and which is fascinating, but it's also uh, extremely cringy. It's when Ed wants to write in dialect. Uh, yeah. Ed will uh, write these long passages in dialect. And I, I thought the most amusing thing was that like, he'll give you the date when this interview was recorded. And then he'll say, uh, it was rewritten at the discretion of the writer. And so, like, like, what's he talking about? He's making all this up. There is no guy, he's, he's not interviewing anybody. He's, this is that's near the very beginning of the book and there's no guy he's not interviewing anybody uh just like in all these articles in when the topic is sex uh these so-called interviews like um like interview with t i think was one of them and th there's no t there, there never was a t they're both ed it's ed interviewing ed and at one point he interviews in that book he interviews a man and his wife so Ed's playing three different parts. He's playing the man, he's playing the wife, and he's playing the interviewer. Uh, so, well, you know, Ed, and Ed grew up in a time when it was not unusual for white authors to write in dialect. 
one one of the major best selling authors of Ed's Youth was uh, the editor of at, at the time the the New Orleans Times Picayune, an author by the name of an editor by the name of Rourke Bradford, who in the 30s was one of the best selling authors in the U.S. Right. And he's completely fallen down the memory <laughs> hole because you know he put out six books that were written completely in what at least he purported to be black dialect and yeah. so by the 1960s those books even even then were beyond the pale what he was writing oh. and and I mean, yet that was something that that was you know getting gushingly positive reviews in the <laughs> new york times of the day well, okay when ed was a youth so you know, I'm just saying that could be a source of why sure. of, of Ed's you tendency, know. Well, you know, to, and other authors of a certain age of their tendency well, to write in, Ed, in that manner at times. Ed loves to write. Uh, Ed, there's a couple of things that Ed loves to write. He loves to write black dialect and southern dialect, uh, right. and southern black dialect. Uh, so, very often in his short stories, in his novels, you'll have characters like this. And Ed gets to work this material in. And the fact that this is a, is a supposed uh, interview with somebody in Watts. And of course, we reviewed the two Watts books. Um, I'm not sure how far Ed was living from, from Watts uh, in the 1970s. Was he close enough? Or, or um, Well, he was in Hollywood, so uh, he wasn't that, that wasn't far that away. Far. Yeah. So, the fact that he he's attributing this to an interviewee who's non-existent means that Ed gets to toss like good taste and the encyclopedic sort of uh, newsy tone right out the window and just, you know, uh, again, just get very explicit and, and very dirty. Um, so th that's, you know, that's his excuse uh, through through all of this, and that's why I mean that there's these jarring uh, there's these jarring uh, shifts in tone uh, throughout the book. Uh, he'll be very sober and serious, probably when he's get, staying closest to the T.K. Peters material, and then he'll be. Sometimes he even gets sort of just um, uh, philosophical and and sort of. This is another tendency of Ed's is where he just starts expounding about life in the universe and he'll kind of forget what he's writing about you know because we have to remember that ed the 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 classic picture of ed as a writer is just him just typing super fast and while he's typing you know probably smoking drinking carrying on conversations um you know and and people like paul marco would say i i I couldn't believe it. You know, we were carrying on this conversation. Ed was, you know, smoking, drinking, having all this fun all the while he's writing. So I have to imagine um, the way he wrote this was just, you know, full steam ahead, just, you know, uh, just typing, 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 typing. I don't know that it took him more than a uh, day, two days, maybe to, to, to write this. Because it because he does he does source a lot of other texts and it, it, it fills right. up a considerable number of pages it is it is a number of books in one right it's a sociological sex book there's also the hints of fiction the tina k story actually uh early on in the book is picked up later in the book and we learn a little bit more about tina k there's what i would describe as case histories those uh pseudo yeah. interviews uh case histories were a very popular subgenre within the adult paperback uh, well, world at the time and ed certainly wrote his share of uh, case histories obviously um black cool. ghetto sex is a book that's uh, quoted throughout this entire book and that, <laughs> yes. was a pen, that was a pendulum Atl atlanta book i think from 1970 and uh by a simon williams and uh yeah. extremely uh, a blank in the in the adult paperback <laughs> publishing world as far as i can tell so uh pendulum but, did did though get into this interracial uh uh sex on, on numerous other occasions i think i have yeah. by one of pendulum shadow presses i have a sociological book called black and white sex orgies or black and white orgies and i have another that's quite similar mm -hmm. the socio sex paperback one last point is uh not an invention of pendulum by the way it did oh. hit the world in 1969 as the trojan horse the Mies commission gave them permission the smut peddlers to trojan horse <laughs> hardcore pornography into the average american's home via the socio sex paperback and uh academy press was another 
extremely prolific uh, publisher of socio-sex paperbacks at the time. You know, God love the Mies Commission because it's only <laughs> because, because the well because the Mies Commission report describes pornographic literature in such explicit loving detail that the Mies Commission report itself is pornography by its <laughs> own definition. So you you have to love the 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 beautiful irony of that. Um, it was it, it was a huge bestseller, and uh, adult paperback yeah. publishers, many of them actually published their own copies of the Mies Commission Report back in the day. Although I got to say, if you're planning to make your way through that book cover to cover, uh, been there, I, done that. Oh wow! <laughs> Good luck to you. I, it it bested me uh, because, uh, boy, it is a long book that has a lot of really boring boring parts to it. so the exciting part there are the exciting parts i was surprised that nobody just did like you know the just the greatest hits uh, of the report and boiled it down to the fun parts you know well, um, it's much like reading the marquis de sade you know you have yeah. these you have these you have these compressed areas of of sex followed by the exhausted participants then going on for 80 pages about abstruse philosophy and you quickly skip by those <laughs> to get to get to the next part that involves nuns and femurs taken out of graves and things like well, that. You know, I once um, found a I once found a book that just took all the dirty and violent parts out of the Bible and and published those in sort of a very slim book. And I found that to be quite entertaining reading. They just get right to the good parts of the Bible. And I thought, um, Boy, this report needs something like that because, uh, oh my God. Although I also find myself reading the the rebuttal. The rebuttal is as almost as long as the report. Uh, the, the the edition that I had had like Charles Keating's, you know, uh, rebuttal to it. Charles <laughs> Keating of the Keating Five, the same that's exact right, guy. Right, right, right. That's, what's so, that's another thing that's so beautiful about that whole episode, right? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Moral. Mr. Morrill was Charles. K it it's almost seems like it was written by a screenwriter, but it's absolutely true. But his outraged rebuttal, it goes on for hundreds and hundreds of pages. So um, the edition that I had, unfortunately, um, once I got I'm very bored in, in reading it and I tossed my paperback copy across the room and it was like a 50 year old paperback copy that was like a mass market paperback and it just the pages just went everywhere <laughs> so I think someone I, I, Greg might have been you you might have sent me just like a pdf of the of the thing it that the pdf of it was sort of circulating around uh the internet so I have it on pdf that can't get thrown across the room but I did have a paper copy of it uh that was published, I think, by the New York Times. I think the New York Times put yeah, a, yeah. an edition of it. It was kind of like the Star. Remember when the Star Report came out? Yeah, the Star Report. It was very much like oh, that, yeah. where you know it became a, a bestseller. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they they should do an, an NFT oh, the of the uh, of the Mies Commission. Oh yeah, non fungible well, token. Turn it into now. A, I remember. Yeah. The, gosh, I'm remembering the Star Report, and I remember people going through that. <laughs> Sorry. Through that. No, right. no, no. I'm remembering people going through like the the fine print on the star yeah. report because supposedly some of the like the really good stuff is like in the <laughs> in the footnotes you know so um yeah that was another one where uh this supposed you know this very dry academic report actually has a, a lot of has a fair amount of dirty stuff well ed i think i won't say that he ever totally abandons the the serious encyclopedic uh, tone because he keeps coming back to it and by the end, he's regained it entirely. Uh, like the, you know, the the epilogue to this book, uh, I think, reads like it could have been written by Charles Keating himself. It, it, it reads like very, very sober and very serious. And it, again, has that same tone that you find, that good citizen tone that you find in uh, Glenn or Glenda. Um, so... I always say that Glenn and Glenda is the Rosetta Stone for understanding Ed Wood's life and career. And um, you see so much of his tone in in uh, in that book. A in this book, um, there's even a phrase like behind closed doors. I think, you know, that was like one of Ed's favorite phrases. Um, I noticed in this book, the, the word that was driving me nuts was affair, because he will use it not only to describe sexual couplings, he'll just use it to mean like thing or item 
like this affair, that affair, that was a dirty affair. That was a shocking affair. You know, he'll just say affair, affair, affair. And thrill, thrill was uh, okay. boring a, a hole into my brain uh, after a few pages. A thrill, he'll get hung up on words. And uh, the, if you don't know that this is Ed Wood, the thing that will give it away immediately is the way he spells the word man. Man, like, like hey, man, man. how's it going? Met <laughs> Anne. Um, he spells it with two A's because I think he's trying to mimic the way like people pronounce it. Like, hey, man, like you'd draw out the A a little bit. Uh, he's the only writer I know who does that. Sometimes he'll even go as far as putting an apostrophe, M-A, apostrophe, A-N. He doesn't bother with the apostrophes. I think maybe the apostrophe key on his uh, typewriter wasn't working or something. But, um, or if, I don't know, he just wasn't bothering with it. So um, I think that goes back, Joe, to Ed, uh, the dialect, right? Wanting to write in a black dialect where you mentioned, yeah. I call it Southern oh. ease. He talks in, and oh. if uh, I have not deeply explored it, but uh, you may know, uh, Joe, because I know I, I sent you some uh, Jim Thompson a little while back, but if you read Jim yeah. Thompson paperbacks from the fifties and early sixties, he does a lot of that sort of uh, adopting that sort of Southern ease too, in a very wood-like manner. And if right, you read right. some of those earlier Jim Thompson books, uh, I, I start to think, could Ed must have read Pulps by Jim Thompson? Oh, and it sure, had some, sure. It had a significant impact, well, actually, on his writing style. Well, Ed and Jim would have had something in common in that they were uh, both yeah. epic alcoholics. Um, <laughs> they were, you know, so uh, and Jim's the quality of Jim's writing could go up and down based on his state of mind or, or his personality at the time, but generally. Uh, in, even in that a batch of novels that you sent me, which are some are, are very odd, uh, uh, Jim, I don't ever, some people find Jim Thompson too inconsistent for them, but I I, I don't. I, I even like kind of bad Thompson or, or, or second tier Thompson. Um, and top tier Thompson, I would put like, I, to me, he, he even leaves people like Raymond Chandler and, and Dashiell Hammett, you know, and, you know, in the dust. To me, he's, when he's at his very, peak uh, form uh because no, it, it just that because he it, it, thompson will take you down into hell and he it, you know in a way that even raymond chandler or dashiell hammett uh won't do um they 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 keep the gloves on and <laughs> thompson takes the gloves off and i'm like yeah yeah that's right that's right you know the killer inside me or whatever um uh, you know, he'll he'll get down and dirty. So uh, that's why I think he would have been a writer after Ed's uh, own heart, because uh, Ed likes to. Um, and the other writer I always thought would have been after Ed's own heart would be our Erskine Caldwell. I always thought Erskine, you know, uh, God's Little Acre and stuff, I thought would have been, you know, right down uh, Ed's path, because um, Ed likes those writers that get, you know, down and dirty. And there's a book, you know, Black Myth is a book that gets done dirty. Now, I did read that that Black Sexual Techniques book uh, a, a while ago on, on my blog, maybe now more than a year ago. I don't know. It feels like a long time ago. I wrote a book, I wrote an article called Drowning in Ed Wood, where I just um, mainlined uh, all these PDFs of Ed's uh, novels and nonfiction books, one after another. And they all just sort of, I said, they, they all blended together in my mind. <laughs> and... Uh, the Black Sexual Techniques is, is a book that, it, it frankly, the, the book originally didn't make that much of an impression on me. And now I find that maybe uh, Ed didn't have anything to do with writing that book, right? It, it was, it was so maybe yeah. that's why it didn't speak to me at the time was because like, I, it was like, it, it was too professional. It was uh, too, it was too coherent. It was too nice and neat. And I was like, oh, I think he actually, does that book actually delve into history and give actual dates and, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I should, and I should circle back and, and make a point that I neglected, which is that um, Peter's conclusion, you know, Peter, like I said, at the beginning, Peter lays out what he calls the black myth, which, mm -hmm. which Ed took and largely ran with to his own ends. Um, Peter's conclusion about the black myth is very interesting because as far, you know, he discusses historical precedents for 
one for one group making these same kinds of claims about another group. So yeah. the claim being that group is oversexed, that group does weird things, that group is irresponsible and promiscuous. Peters lays out evidence that that's actually, if you look back in, and in human, what we have in preserved writings and things, that that's an, a not uncommon claim for one group to make against another. Yeah. And so when he gets to the end of his book, you know, his conclusion is that those kinds of claims of whites against blacks are just yet another variant of this unsupported allegation that one group makes against another group that it disfavors for some reason right. um, and that just leaves the part then from his statement of the black myth the only part that leaves unaddressed is uh do black men have bigger lumber than white men or not <laughs> and peter's conclusion on that is again he says actually there needs to be a study of that because he says if you look at the literature and the various claims that have been made it's all anecdotes Right. It's I generally think, um, anecdotes that people are saying for a particular purpose. So, so that's really the conclusion of his work is that the, the myth is largely a myth and the residuum that he can't resolve is something that should be studied. Okay, what would you say Ed's conclusion is in this book? Because I was trying to figure that out for like 200 pages. I think it's, I think it's actually Kinsey that he cites and uh, Kinsey said, yeah. uh, it's Kinsey who said, Based on studies, uh, there's no, no, no difference between a white man and a black man in terms of average penile length to get clinical. But uh, he cites others who say otherwise. The, yeah, and again, he himself again floats in both directions. The captions only convolute the matter even more because uh, the very first caption yeah. of the book, as a matter of fact, let me see I, if I remember this correctly, touches on that. The very first caption of a photo on page one of the book the introduction page the facing page is his penis is larger by far so okay that's uh, uh it seems like a pretty clear resounding uh uh agreement with the with that element of the black myth the black myth does have a couple elements not only the uh, carrying yeah. the larger lumber but having that overheated sex drive which the black right. woman okay. also uh she has that component of the black myth uh in her nature as well Suppose and, I'm not saying that the book. And then there's the there's the that. chart, and then there's the charge that incest in the black community is not a big deal, and that like, you know, going to bed with your cousin is is a common occurrence or or was a common occurrence. I don't know where Ed is is drawing this material from, but you know what 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 is interesting today there is such a call to like well let's leave the past in the past and. Uh, we can't dwell on, you know, uh, slavery times forever. But Ed's views on black and white relations and black and white sex uh, are seemingly all rooted in ideas of slavery and the plantation and the, the master-slave relationship. Uh, he comes back to that uh, dynamic over and over and over and over again. He never strays far from it. And then I realized... You know, this book is this book is 50 years old, over 50 years old. And at that time, we were a couple of generations closer to the the Civil War. Uh, we were, you know, it's not even within living, you know, it's not wouldn't have even been within living memory then, but it would have been for like his parents or grandparents you know so um so ed's closer to, to to slavery times than we are so uh it, it dominates his thinking well so he derives that from peter's work okay because peter's you know when, when did peter's write this by the way but uh, when did this when was he his original writing being done that's a tough one. I think uh, my okay. impression, Jim, I'd uh, appreciate your thought on it. I think it's over a lengthy stretch of time. He was putting together okay. a large sex compendium. And, uh, you know, if they're cobbling things together from this Peter source, he covers the gamut of, of sexual topics, everything imaginable, and then some. So I'd have to imagine, you know, being that he sort of uh, 
was an ethnographer of a sort back in the 1920s. Uh, once he became a, a sex therapist uh, after his time spent putting together the crypt of civilization in the in the 1930s for Oglethorpe University. Once he gets into the 50s and he quote unquote retires, becomes a sex therapist. I would say it's during that time. He's a sex therapist. He's starting to garner all these different stories from his patients and things like that. And yet at the same time, as a, as a filmmaker in the 1920s, shooting uh, shooting tribes and, and going uh, to far flung lands and, and, and really getting into what I'm calling for lack of a better term, ethnography, I think uh, it could happen during that larger spectrum of time that he's generally interested in humans on the whole and sexuality in particular. Yeah, I mean, he's citing literature yeah. from the 30s, 40s, uh, up through up through the mid-60s. Um, you know, to be quite clear, you know, he's right, you know, the, the book is Black Sexual Habits, but that's really a misnomer because what he's talking about is African American sexual habits. Right. His, book start, his book is basically starting with um, what were the what were the sexual relations among African Americans mm -hmm. in slavery, and then from that point yeah. forward. So that's really where Ed is getting that, if you will, um, that antebellum heavier influence. All right, so narrative yeah. that he has because Peters is 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 taking you know blacks once they've been enslaved in the americas and then what was their life like from that point well, forward you know, through the beginnings of you know desegregation in his lifetime so yeah i, I was just surprised at, at how much that um figures and you know the, how how big that uh, uh that figures in the how much that figures in the uh, in this book all the way through it. So Ed never gets his mind off of that topic. I guess he can't. I guess he's tethered to that uh, to that T.K. Peters uh, source material. But in a way, you know, that material is still on people's minds. I, I was looking up when the movie Mandingo was made, and that's 1975. So that was a few years later than this. Um, yeah. Um, no, so, I, I I wanted to I wanted to throw out some odd things I noticed in Ed's text. Good, and I I, I want to just plenty of them. I want to just quick plow through them, um, sort of serially, and then I'll shut <laughs> up and let you guys launch into whatever you want to. No, no, I don't want to sort fine. of stop along the way. To no, no, it, it, go for it. You, there's nothing but odd things in this book, so go ahead. <laughs> I want to try to throw these all out on the table at once, for good or ill. Um, the first thing is, you know, on page 26, I had to wonder whether Ed's trying to tell us something about his time in the Marines or not, because he's got this cute little anecdote about a, uh, you know, he lapses into bad black dialogue to relate the account of this mm -hmm. black man who's against Cunnilingus, but he knows the taste of cum thanks to his time in the army. <laughs> yep. Okay, moving along. <laughs> <laughs> um you know there's you, you had you had mentioned glenn or glenda and and certainly the the glenn or glenda voice is sort of present off and on throughout the book right you know, ed has some discussions about that whole one of the important what i thought one of the important glenn or glenda dynamics which is individual happiness and fulfillment versus societal constraints that pops up throughout this book um, in, in fact, there's even one point at which he says something along the line. Uh, it's not quite said this way, but in my mind, as I read the sentence, I heard Glenn or Glenn, give a man his soft, silky garments. Right, and, right. He's, he's a better mm -hmm. citizen. Like, you know? Yeah, there's, credit there's to his government. Of that in here. Um, in the first chapter and later in the book, Ed touches on what was called the New Thought Movement which was um, a spiritual movement that coalesced in the U.S. in the late 19, 19th century. Um, it led to a lot of what we would call the New Age today. Um, mm. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to this in a second when he brings up a, a, uh, a preacher slash cult leader by the name of Father Divine, but I want to push that off for a second. Um, 
partway through the book, there's one of these case histories that is a white woman describing her the first time she has sexual relations with a black man. And what I found so striking about that was that it could have been taken out of a demonology manual of medieval times. The descript I mean I've I've read a I've read a lot of uh Montague Summers and other demonologists and it was so striking the physical description was straight out of medieval descriptions of women having sex with devils well, and 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 I just bring that up because it was it's sort of like I guess this is just the universal description of the other yeah you know I mean, well Ed's written about literal sex with devils he's written about that in a couple of his short stories that's been something that he wrote uh, at least i think at least twice about women having sex with actual demons or devils um, the, de so the, the devil ed, sorry the devil gets a mention here too just a quick mention yeah. Yeah. so ed also brings up what i'm going to jokingly call blackward masking um at one point he starts talking about how black men are vital to the music industry and yet okay. most record buyers are white girls and that the black men are making strange beats and noises okay. and 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 communicating in infathomable sort of cryptic ways to their own. And, and it just struck me. It was almost like, gosh, this is like Ed's version of backward masking. The, the albums are being encoded. Right. With this secret. <laughs> well, That's why I said blackward masking. Well, um, you know, it's. What's interesting about that particular passage is that he s thinks of rock and roll. He, I think he specifically says rock and roll yeah. as a as a primarily black music form, uh, which you know in the nineteen mid nineteen fifties it, it was, but by the early nineteen seventies it, it was not. So uh, he has this idea of the black rock and rollers. He doesn't know what rock and roll is. I don't think. Um, making these records and getting, I guess, using these strange beats and things to entrance the white women. Um, I, I don't know how much of that is, you know, who, how much of that is based in, in any version of reality. I think by the 1970s, most acts that you would call rock and roll were mostly white. And I, I don't know if, if white women were going to R&B uh, acts a, a lot like R and B concerts in the 1970s. I, I I can't imagine that they they were. He refers to it, Joe, uh, as Afro tunes at one point a with Afro a capital tunes. A and a capital A and a capital T. Afro tunes. The white women love the the Afro music. The Afro music. Okay. So, you know, again, uh, God. You know, I, about half of Ed's sources are easily accessible right now. The other half are obscure porn books whether we'll ever be able to see those <laughs> or not to actually track down what ideas in this whole mix were really ed's or possibly barred from others who well, know um, i don't know that how much ed is is in touch with popular culture of the 1970s sometimes you know in some of his articles he'll make uh in some of his non-fiction articles he'll make fairly timely references and i'll think like oh okay ed was keeping up with the times in this I don't think he references any recent movies or anything like that. The, the few yeah. movies that he references are all decades old. So, um, yeah, it's it's difficult to say. Uh, we had a there was there was a debate. You know, there's a scene in um, Fugitive Girls that is very similar to something that happens in A Clockwork Orange, and there's been a debate: is it possible that Ed Wood would have seen A Clockwork Orange? And my point is, my point of view on that was that it's possible. Uh, A Clockwork Orange was not an obscure art film or anything. It was one of the top 10 grossing films of the year. I think it came out in like 71. I think it came out around the same time. Uh, so Ed definitely kept tabs on the industry. 
Um, I'm not sure if he was reading Variety every day, but uh, I'm not sure if he was, you know, keeping up with the uh, with the trade papers. But he lived in Hollywood, where there's billboards everywhere uh, for movies. So uh, I don't know to what extent Ed Wood kept up with things. Um, I don't think he knows. That, I don't know that he knows much about uh, contemporary music or anything like that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't imagine that he does. Um, so. So yeah, let, was, me, let me let me forge no, ahead. ahead. Yes, please um, do. Sorry. One one of the one of the more interesting references that you find in in both books, presumably in Black Sex Habits, it was imported by Hal Cantor, because I I have my doubts that T K Peters was reading Sex Rebel Black from <laughs> 1968 by Bob Green, so I'm assuming it was imported by Cantor. The text that appears in Black Sex Habits is reproduced in toto in Black Myth. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, uh, this book has a great subtitle, Memoirs of a Gash Gourmet, <laughs> um, <laughs> published by Greenleaf Classics. Oh, okay. Greenleaf. Okay. okay now, Greenleaf. this is a very curious and interesting book for several reasons. First of all, at the time... It was purported to be the autobiography of a black man's four decades of sexual adventures. Um, and it was accepted as that. It was accepted at face value that it was an autobiography. Okay, this becomes important because um, in actuality, it was a semi-autobiography. Semi we don't know what is true or not true in it. And that's important because the book includes um, tales of homosexuality and pedophilia in it in very in a very frank fashion. Okay, why is this? Who even cares about that now in this semi-autobiographical book? Well, Bob Green was a pseudonym. There's no shock. Uh, the actual author of the book was a man by the name of Frank Marshall Davis who is a longtime radical activist, journalist, and member of the Communist Party USA. This became an issue in 2008 when the book was used as the basis for allegations that Davis was in fact a pedophile. So people decided to take this book that was who knows to what degree fictional and read it as complete fact to make these allegations against Davis. Okay, still you're wondering, well, who cares? Well, in, in his 1995 autobiography, Dreams from My Father, presidential candidate Barack Obama mentioned that Davis was a family friend and an influence on him early in life. So wow. when Obama ran for president the first time, forces on the right who had found this out, latched onto it, and tried to use this all as a smear against Obama's character. So I just thought that was a rather... Wow. And of course, the book has now become insanely collectible as a result. You know, before 2008, you could have probably picked up a copy if you found it for 10 or $15. Now it's up like three, 400. But, you know, and, and, it, and it sort of shines in not that we should be surprised, right? That it shines an interesting light on politics that people would take a book of dubious factuality and just assume it's true to the detriment of someone. Right. So the last, the last little point I wanted to bring up was, you know, I had mentioned that Ed has some points in the book where he touches on what's considered to be the new thought movement. Um, Deep in the book, Ed brings up an ex as, as an example of a, a black man who successfully had a long-term relationship with a white woman. He brings up a, a man by the name of Father Divine. Okay. Um, let me just flip to my notes here so I can stay on track. So who is or who was Father Divine? Okay. Um, so Father Divine, also known as the Reverend Major Jealous Divine, was an African-American New Thought spiritual leader from about 1907 until his death in 1965. Um, he founded the International Peace Mission Movement, 
um, and oversaw its growth from a small black denomination in Harlem into a large multiracial international church with tens of thousands of members. Um, is often considered to be a cult leader because he claimed to be God. And on the other hand, for the time period, we're talking 20s, 30s and forward, um, he ran an interracial organization. Um, he preached against all sorts of social ills like intoxicants, gambling, uh, debt. And unfortunately, much like the Shakers, he also preached against sex, including that for his married members. So ultimately, his international peace mission was sort of self-destroying in the long run because it, it didn't it, it, it promoted you know, not producing children, which isn't really a good way to have a no, uh, church. Well, um, now it's 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 interesting that Ed mentioned Father Divine because when Ed was a youth in Poughkeepsie, is when Father Divine's church in Harlem had expanded so greatly and a comp and and. Uh, uh, accumulated so much, so much funds that they started buying lots of uh, property, farms, and businesses up around in the Poughkeepsie and Kingston area. Um, and at that time in the 30s, that caused a huge stink in the area. There was a big backlash by the New York Klan that burned a bunch of their buildings. Um, they were not welcome in the area, but ultimately, um, the locals came to recognize that these were very staid, serious, hardworking people who in fact made good neighbors. Whatever, the, whatever their preconceptions had been about this being a, well, God knows what they would have called it back then. Let's say they would have called it a mixed race cult or something. Um, the bottom line on the ground is that these folks were good hardworking, friendly neighbors, so that that initial backlash against um, roughly 3,000 people suddenly moving into Ulster County and, and uh, taking over all sorts, I shouldn't say taking over, but, you know, assuming ownership and moving on to all sorts of properties, the, the, that negative sort of backlash went away with time. Now, what's, what's sort of interesting about all of this is that in uh, Edwin Lee Canfield's book about Criswell that just, just came out, yeah, um, he mentions uh, this little anecdote about how Criswell, when he graduated, after graduating from the University of Cincinnati, he took over as actor and lead manager for two summers at a little theater called the Greenkill Park Theater that was near Kingston, New York. Um, in fact, it was in a small town called Eddyville, southwest of Kingston. Um, Greenkill, it was part of the Greenkill Park Inn, which was a 177 acre summer resort in Eddysville that had a 700 room hotel, 40 bungalows, um, a nine hole golf course, uh, almost a dozen tennis courts, swimming pools, stables, all sorts of things. It was a big early Catskill resort, essentially. Um, and, you know, Criswell ran that theater for two years, but then Father Divine's group actually purchased that resort to turn it into a school. So Criswell lost that first gig that he had. And I just thought it was really interesting. You know, what are the odds that maybe the, the woods on a summer weekend, went out to the Green Hill Park Theater to see a production. Um, Criswell was not using his name Criswell at that time. He was actually using, uh, I'd have to look it up again, but he was using a, a, a sort of a different, a different uh, stage name at that time. But I, I always thought that was interesting that maybe they had run into each other potentially and not even, not even known it years later. Nonetheless, it, I thought it was curious that Criswell washed up 
less than 20 miles from Ed for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, That's incredible, this, Jim. This yeah, that is, uh, I couldn't believe it. When you, we talked about that before we went on the air here, and I couldn't believe that, the, the coincidence of that. Um, and that it would tie in that uh, that you found uh, a connection to Edward and Criswell to Father Divine. <laughs> uh, that goes. I will. I will admit that while I was reading this book, I, I was having to stop to um, Google and Wikipedia uh, names just every couple of pages because. Um, Father Divine was somebody I had vaguely heard about. Uh, but I didn't really know anything about Father Divine. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Greg. Did you have a similar experience? I mean, did you did you recognize a lot of these names, or were they f unfamiliar to you? Unf mostly unfamiliar. I mean, I recognized obviously names like Havelock Ellis, some of the some of the names right. that you see in tons of socio sex paperbacks. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> some of the folks who are commonly cited in the uh, in the bibliographies of many of the Pendulum books, I recognize them, but. No, okay. so many of these names were utterly unfamiliar to me. You know, so, and the weird, the weird coda to the Father Divine story, before I forget it, was, you know, he died in 1965. And at that point, his wife took over leadership of the church. And several years later, I think it was around 1971, um, Jim Jones, of all people, certainly a cult leader by anyone's reckoning sure. he suddenly came forward and tried to take over the leadership of the whole of that whole church the international peace mission by claiming that when father divine passed away his spirit transferred into jim jones's body oh. and so that everyone you know should now follow should now leave the international peace mission and and join Jim Jones's Jones's church, which itself was an you know an interracial organization. Right. So uh, there were some followers that transferred over, but largely they ignored Jim J and and ended up dying in Guyana. Right. Um, but largely uh, the International Peace Mission members um, ignored that. Uh, and and like I said, the group largely has died off. There's still some aged members hanging on. In you know, I just saw. I was just. I had just seen an article about that, about the the last few members of um, of the Father Divine movement. Uh, and as you say, they're they're they've got to be what in their 70s, 80s, maybe or 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 around there. So, um, yeah, it's un unbelievable. Um, the names that I, the, the weirdest name that I came across in this book was Dr. Irving Bieber, who is cited as an expert on homosexuality and what causes people to become homosexuals. And uh, Ed uses him as an example of um, what might cause a black person to become homosexual and what might not. And uh, Irving Bieber was this was a doctor who believed that um, homosexuality was a choice. And he was one of the people that you cited. If that was your thesis, you, you went to him. And uh, when Bieber's work was uh, discredited in his later years, uh, I read his obituary in the New York Times and they said it was very difficult for him. And he didn't, uh, he didn't want to admit fault and he didn't you know, want to admit that he had been wrong all this time. And so that was how he was remembered as this guy who was, you know, basically, you know, saying the earth was flat, basically, he's one of those guys, you know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, the guy who's on the wrong, the wrong side of history. So I thought, how interesting that um, this was written during that window of time when Irving Bieber would have still been a respected, uh, respected expert. So um, I don't know where Father Divine's reputation is these days, uh, how history uh, views him. Uh, do they view him as a civil rights leader or as a cult leader or both? Um, it's hard to say. I, I think he gets, I think he's largely been forgotten. Yeah. Um, he, he, I, I think he gets both of these, those appellations that you just said. Yeah, I mean, there were clearly cultic aspects to his movement. But on the other hand, 
you know, it was a, um, it, it was a group preaching interracial equality at a time when that was just not happening in the U.S. Um, and, and they were living the example, you know, so. And again, when, when um, there's another a name that I had no idea about, Henry Hamilton Johnson, uh, Johnston, uh, Sir H.H. H. Johnson. Uh, I'm imagining that this is, this is another name that Ed or Dick Trent cites as being another expert. Um, I'm assuming this all comes from, I'm assuming this comes from the TK Peters material and that Ed had no idea who Sir H.H. H. Johnson, uh, Johnston was either. So um, I had to look him up on, on Wikipedia. And when I did it, it was like, he's one of the key figures in the so-called scramble for Africa. And then I was looked up, okay, what's the scramble for <laughs> Africa? And it was basically the, the, colonization of Africa uh, by, you know, by whites, basically. And um, so it's interesting that Ed is citing this H.H. H. Johnston as an expert or as a reputable uh, uh, person. And maybe he's not doing it directly. Uh, he's citing T.K. Peters, who was in right. turn citing. So, um, yeah, you know, a lot of the people who are uh, cited in this book uh, their reputations have either disappeared or have diminished or crumbled. Uh, but I guess that's always the, what happens when you when you write uh, uh, academic books, because, you know, we keep getting more knowledgeable. We keep getting, uh, you know, society keeps evolving. And so um, it's it's tough in those fields to keep, you, to keep your reputation um, after all these decades. So. Um, for me, if, if that's if there's a reason to read Black Myth, other than you're interested in, in Ed Wood, it's it's uh, for a guided tour through um, all these experts of the past, you know, <laughs> and well, you mentioned Havelock Ellis. I mean, what is Havelock Ellis's reputation today? Is he remembered? Is he still respected? What do you I think? think? Like a lot of the sort of self-styled uh, sexologists of the era, outside of you know the the heavyweights like like say Kinsey, Masters, and Johnson, all these guys who uh, I, I believe them to be uh, serious at the time <laughs> in in their well, endeavors. You know, people... But they they had to write. There was no outlet uh, outside of uh, eventually no outlet for them to write other than the sex paperbacks. So they kind right. of end up, I think, end up being sort of a, a like a fly in amber. Havelock Ellis is a flying amber at that point in time. If you don't read adult sex paperbacks, you probably have no idea who Havelock Ellis is. You know, there, you know, you've got these folks. Um, let, let's let's be let's be honest, right? Pioneers yeah. are headed. Are, you know, anybody who gets the the tag of being a pioneer, you're, you're heading into uncharted territory. Yep. You're probably going to be mostly wrong. Wrong. So yeah, yeah and, the, and the, there's the, actually and there's actually nothing there's. Reuse the word. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Well, um, people have undercut Kinsey and Masters and Johnson over and over and over again, and I, I think it's a mistake to think, well, it's because they were ignorant or or cruel or something like that. You know, it's just that that was a snapshot of the times. They it was the best you could do at that time. It was the best we knew then. So, um, and, and let's not kid ourselves, right, folks who want to criticize Kinsey in particular for bias. That's universal. Right. Um, and that's goes across ages. That's always, a, that's always an issue with any, mm -hmm. with any sort of investigation. So yeah, you know, I, um, I, I think it's true of all of these and this gets back to Peter's, right? I, I think when you look at some of these, when you look at these works that are dated, really, if you're being fair, all, all you can really ask is, well, was the author fairly representing the the literature of his day, or that he would have had, or right. she would have had access to? If right. they were doing that, even if it was completely erroneous, you know, you've got to at least grant them the the uh 
you have to grant them the courtesy of, well, at least they were being a fair dealer in what they were trying to do, regardless of how mistaken that may have been, right? We learn, we learn with time. Now, if it, if it's, if you can prove otherwise that, well, okay, no, there was actually a bunch of literature out there, but this person is cherry picking for a particular purpose. Sure. And that's another story entirely. Um, well, you know, if Ed Wood is putting himself forward as any kind of expert in the in this book, which he he's put himself forward as an expert on many topics, many, many, many topics over the years. In in this book in particular on black and white race relations, on black sex. I will ask you to point blank. Is Ed Wood or was Ed Wood racist? Oh. Well, well, so, I so, think he, he. Go ahead, Jim. No, no, sorry. Go ahead, Greg. No, I'm gonna say. I think, <laughs> no, go he, ahead. Go ahead. You know, nobody wants to answer the question no, no, again. No. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually probably uh, not answer the question because I'm gonna say he was of two minds. He ascribed to a lot of the the stereotypes okay. of of his time, while at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, he does believe in that sort of uh, judgy not. Again, going back to Glenn or Glenda, judgy sure. not sort of viewpoint, okay. and uh, he he's trying to be open-minded here at various points throughout black myth where he's trying to trying to take a i want to say he's trying to well, take a seriously objective view uh as skewed as it, it all comes out in the wash well you know as as we were making our way through the watts novels now those books have been described as racist but there are passages in it where you have the main character Rocky, I believe, was that his name? Rocky, yeah. Rocky, wondering, why do I have to be treated this way just because I'm Black? Why is Black considered evil? Why is, you know, um, so you have Ed trying to see it from Rocky's uh, point of view. Uh, did we land on any definitive answer on what ed thinks of the black is beautiful slogan or the black is beautiful movement because that certainly gets referenced here yeah well i want to go back uh, real quick before we jump into sure. that one but uh jim did you want to oh, touch yes. on that question is is, ed <laughs> is Woodard, ed Woodard a racist? racist yeah yeah so maybe this is going to sound like a cop-out but you know <laughs> well, I, 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 well, I've, got, I I've got two i've got two thoughts right the first of all that Racist is an in incredibly squishy term, depending on sure. on who's who's talking about it and defining it. Um, you know, from my experience in life, I, I'm not. I wouldn't pass judgment on Ed because I never observed how he treated other people. I can certainly think of cases of people I know that, on the one hand, would say things that lots of people might consider racist, but in their personal relations with individuals never mistreated somebody right so so that person i would never want to call to me a racist it gets into the it gets into the zone of action you know Gr growing right. up i certainly heard people make all sorts of off color and mean remarks that could be classified as racist but i never actually saw those people right behave in a, in, in a manner that was negative to somebody and then later in life i actually ran across people who were quite well behaved and quite respectable but i had occasion to actually see them act in extremely racist and deleterious fashion to right. african americans for example so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it, it can be very funny and shaky ground, which is why, you know, not having actually, without any evidence of how Ed may have treated individuals, you know, sure. and, 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 you know, this is what it comes down to, right? I, it, we could, we could step out of the, out of the race box and just say, I could have all sorts of ideas about moral probity. Right. And I can preach and preach and preach and preach and preach. But if I'm put to the test, if I then don't follow what I've been preaching, right? right. Then all that chatter I was doing was absolutely worthless. Because at the at the point at which I was actually tested, I failed. 
and, I think, and, I, and, I, and I view this in that same manner, right? That the chatter is one thing, but the point at which somebody's tested and, and how they treat somebody else for me is really the key. Well, you know, these issues have been um, there. I mean, if you want descriptions of how Ed treated people around him, I guess you could go through Nightmare of Ecstasy and find examples of when he was living in Yucca Flats and uh, how he and his wife uh, talked about neighbors and talked about people in their uh, in their neighborhood. Um, maybe part of the reason why this has been on my mind is that the cable channel MeTV has lately been uh, started to rerun the series uh, All in the Family. And I have to wonder if Ed ever watched uh, All in the Family and if so, what he thought of Archie Bunker, because the phrase black is beautiful is debated in the very first episode of All in the Family, uh, just as it's debated in this book, Black Myth. And I have to wonder, I mean, normally the description of, of Archie Bunker is that he is a bigot. Uh, and often he's described as, as racist. And you have to wonder, like, does he treat people unkindly or does he treat people cruelly or unfairly in his life uh, because of these views? And I don't know that he does. Uh, Archie Bunker is actually a much more complex character than we might initially think, you know? Um, and I think that show is very much worth watching in 2023 because it's, it's, it's so interesting how little America has actually changed uh, in 50 years. So, um, some of the debates that Meathead and Archie are having on those shows, um, obviously the, the specific names and the specifics of, of, of the issues that they're discussing uh, have changed, but the underlying morality is still there. And maybe Archie is being more genuine and sometimes uh, uh, Meathead is being the one who is hypocritical. And not always being, you know, he's saying all of the so-called politically correct things, but maybe he's not always politically, maybe he, maybe he has prejudice underneath that comes out occasionally. Um, so I have to wonder if, uh, if Ed ever saw All in the Family, it was the number one show in America. So, and Ed, we know, watched a lot of television. The television was one of his, uh, was one of his uh, prized possessions. So I had to wonder if he watched it and what he thought of um of of that show and that character i think he might have found himself agreeing with uh, archie bunker on a lot of um on a lot of issues and i wonder how much people today would agree with archie on stuff and how much they would agree with meathead to me it's 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 very very interesting it's a very interesting sort of litmus test for people to watch that show and what they what they find themselves laughing at so uh, I think, Joe, when you and I talked about Yes, Sir, Mr. Bones, uh, a minstrel film, I think we mentioned this, but there's an episode, a two-part episode yes. of All in the Family, where Archie's uh, Lodge brothers want him to come perform in blackface in with blackface. them at the Lodge, and Archie doesn't do it. Archie, right. Archie's not comfortable doing that. So to, that goes back to your point, Jim, where I don't think your answer was a cop-out because I feel like no. perhaps I, I was copping out to a degree too. We have to remember that Poughkeepsie was very much a Caucasian town when Ed was a kid growing up. If you look through his high school right. yearbooks, you'll see very little ethnic diversity whatsoever. And a matter of fact, uh, um, he was in an area of the world where just across the river, you've got sort of the, a sort of very, very Caucasian sort of, I, I want to say hayseed mentality that comes up in some right. of his works as well. And we've talked about that previously. So yeah, I, again, I view it as he ascribes to a lot of the stereotypes that are right. readily, sadly readily available language, et cetera, that's uh, in the, in the white culture, the primarily dominant white culture, but if push came to shove, is he really, to Jim's point, is he a, a racist who will take action? It's telling, too, uh, Tony Black Empress, uh, Ed Paperback from a couple years prior to this, is uh, one, of, one of my favorite Ed books, by the way. I think of it as sort of the uh, 
gone gone with the wind of the black power movement it's very rarely it's it's this little scene actually uh, jim has a copy of it actually and i know okay. a couple other people who do but it's as little read as black myth probably by even even pretty uh serious ed wood fans but in that book the heroine of the book is tony black empress and she is uh still at the beginning of the book still living on the plantation 100 years after the civil war in black myth ed mentions at one point that uh black people didn't leave the plantation after the civil war because of fear of change which is an odd odd notion when really it was obviously socioeconomic factors that drove it but uh there's black black power uh political aspect to tony black empress which again we get a little bit of a taste of here and as mentioned the black is beautiful movement to your point joe comes up in the book and uh the the yeah. black woman now because black is beautiful is now finally attractive in the eyes of the black man whereas uh during the antebellum days uh the the black woman uh it was a supposedly the black culture of the antebellum south was a mate on the plantation was a matriarchy according to ed whereas the the plantation owners it was a patriarchy of course it all gets convoluted in that that trade-off of chapter by chapter there's black a... man white woman white woman black man etc et <laughs> well there's there's the word convoluted ed's <laughs> ed's views ed, ed's views on race are byzantine they are labyrinthine <laughs> um so that's another reason why this book is is sometimes a difficult read because you you'll find yourself going through the maze and trying to figure out what ed actually thinks so maybe it maybe the process of writing something like this uh, is ed working through his own feelings on it i will say though that there are some passages in this where he leans so heavily into the stereotypes and negative stereotypes that uh it was uncomfortable to read uh there are there there is a there are portions of this um i don't know maybe you guys didn't find that i i, I found that there were portions of this where i was kind of embarrassed to be reading like oh my god if people knew i was reading this they what would they think oh my god <laughs> um but um you know ed i guess ed was dealing with i think we've determined ed was not even a probably not even a high school graduate and probably right. didn't even wasn't. graduate from right. high school. I'm confident he wasn't. Yeah. Right. So, um, Ed was, I don't know how, how, uh, I guess Archie Bunker would be actually younger than Ed, but, um, I, I, not, like by similar, much. not by yeah. much, but a similar vintage. And I don't think, you know, Archie doesn't go to clan meetings. He doesn't try to, you know, do anything, like really evil like that he has a lot of these ideas embedded in his mind from the way he was raised and 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 the ideas that he was grew up with and of course ed is going to have all of that so um i guess i don't know either but um there there just are passages in this and i'm sorry i'm so there are passages in this where i think it gets a little he wallows in negative stereotypes sometimes to too great an extent uh, he's too willing to indulge uh, in some of the worst of the stereotypes. And again, I have to mention a passage about having sex in bathrooms in the ghetto. Uh, mm -hmm. th that was a passage where, oh God, I was that, well, that was that was early tough on in the book. Through. It's a bit. Uh, it gets a bit disturbing early on in the book. Uh, he mentions it perhaps six or eight times that on the plantation you could hear the sounds of the of the D word folks uh, having sex constantly all night, floating up into the ether across the plantation. Everyone could hear so, it. Like it was just nonstop. That's just uh, so what what they do, now, right? Right. Now the audience for this book must have been a hundred percent white, right? Like the the audience for this book. There's 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 not black people buying this book, right? I well, would not think that was a big part of the demographic. No, no. What and is it's the all men, <laughs> and it's and it's all men buying the book, right? It's all white straight men. Yeah, pretty much. I'd I, say I, the, I can't, I can't it's the raincoat imagine. crowd, the so-called raincoat crowd, right? The middle-aged businessman or the young, okay. the young, uh, the young guy, the young what we would call now an incel trying to get his kicks, something like I, that. Yes, I suppose so. Because the thing is, like the the the. The people in pornographic magazines and movies, they're all they're all younger actors, but they weren't attending these movies because they didn't need to. They like, you know, 
they were all they were all out there doing it. And, you well, know, these they guys, didn't, they, right? These guys are living vicariously through them. Clearly, except right? maybe maybe things like maybe things like um, Deep Throat became such a scene that people would go. But when I think of the people attending Deep Throat, I think of like middle aged couples going to see. <laughs> by by the way, we get a couple of really some of the most graphic uh, sexually described scenes in the book are are two two oral sex scenes, uh, which. Uh, <laughs> I don't even want to say. Oh, that's what it I, gets so okay. so descriptive at one point. We're literally well, okay. following the semen down the throat into the stomach passage. Well, you know, that's why I was thinking. You know, um, sometimes Ed Wood's works are rediscovered, and a handful of them get republished and redistributed to find a new audience. Um, is there any commercial potential whatsoever? for black myth is there is there any potential for a, a, a reissue is there anything that the public would want to see is, is there any circumstance under which this book could actually reach an audience you know if if i could find all of the sources he cites the obscure ones and, and of course this is the kind of thing that most people would be like my god why did you do this no one's interested <laughs> You people know, are asking that question right now if they watch this podcast. Yes, this they're, they're, why am I watching you know, this? I, I, I would, for my own my own interest, I would love an annotated text where I could <laughs> I did where I could identify, right? Where we'd have the text well, of black myth and you'd highlight, okay, okay, all the parts that came from the Peters original intact. Well, these are highlighted in light yellow. Well, and, you know, and you know, and you do this for all the sources, and then we'd have the we we, we there would be the residuum, which would presumably be things that Ed created. Well, you know, I was talking earlier about the anthologies that that uh, Bob Blackburn has has curated, and I think of those three. the The first one, Blood Splatters Quickly, is Ed's most accessible material. I think if I were if somebody were just dipping their toe into the to the swimming pool of Ed Wood's writing, so to speak, to use a very tortured metaphor, uh, I would say, oh, oh, start with start with like start with um, start with the blood splatters quickly book. It's got like, um, you know, to kill a Saturday night and and, and things like that, you know, where um, this is not a book that I would say it, is for beginners. I don't, I don't. I wouldn't say like this is like the first Ed Wood book uh, you should read. Uh, you know the the novels that are still technically in print, thing or or recently in print, things like a um, uh, Devil Girls, uh, a, a Killer in Drag, uh, a, you know Death of a Transvestite. Uh, these tend to be on the more accessible side. Uh, I would say books that are, are ripe for rediscovery are probably Ed's uh, circus or carnival uh, novels like Sideshow Siren and Merry Go Round. I think that might reach an audience. Um, I, you know, to put Ed in his place, right? Well, the first thing I would say is I think this book would, you know, if you put this out again, it, it would need framing and no yes. explanation. Well, you couldn't just release it on the road. But to put Ed in his place... What followed this in the 1980s in adult publishing, um, there's stuff that content-wise, comparatively, is so horrific that it makes the racial content of the Black okay. myth look like, you know, Mr. Rogers talking to kids. Okay, well... So, so I'm, I'm... And that's not to, that's not to you know... Uh, you're, sort of you're soft, referring of well, you know, soft, soft pedal what Ed did, but you know right. any of this stuff would need a lot of context. context. Well, you know, recently there was some sort of like semi bootleg, but it got onto Amazon uh, reissues of Ed's of a few of Ed's books. Uh, I didn't buy any of them, uh, but they're like I don't know, like twenty thirty dollars a piece. Uh, Greg knows the books that I'm. The, the yeah, I think, that yeah, I'm, they're even on the high end of that, like thirty, thirty-five like dollars. Or or yeah, they're yeah. extremely overpriced. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, they would be cheaper than buying like the originals that you could get from the '60s and '70s, which are now yeah. hugely expensive. But I was very surprised that one of the books that got reissued in that batch of books was called *The Oralists*, which is like a a, a, 
bunch of case studies, case studies, they're, they're all fake, but like a fake Masters and Johnson type thing, uh, because that book has, okay, that book has some, some material in it that uh, shocked me even. I, I, I felt like, you know, after you read so much of Ed Wood, like, you know, your senses go dead, you know, for, for a bit and your sensibilities just, you're, you're just numb to it. But uh, the oralist shocked me. So I was like, oh my God, jeez yeah. Louise. But yeah. maybe things, but maybe there, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm still naive. I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes after I've read some of Ed's stuff that I've wallowed around in the mud and the dirt, uh, because Ed likes to, I guess that's one thing, that's one blessing we can count here is that in some of his fiction and uh, Ed sometimes likes to actually get physically disgusting. He kind of likes to wallow in disgusting details. He gets in that mood occasionally where he, uh, you mentioned the semen going into the stomach, which is more graphic than you'd want it to be. But for some reason, like Ed, I think there's there maybe still like is a naughty schoolboy side to his personality where he occasionally likes to just wallow in disgusting, uh, yeah. very unsexy details uh, in these stories. But um, the oralists is the oralist was beyond the pale for for me. So I was like, no mas. Like, I, I got through it. I got through that book. But I was like, uh, whew, that was that was tough sledding. Joe, this is why you need those pornographic photos in there. They're a relief from the text when you're trying. <gasps> well, this <laughs> the, the photographs. Oh my gosh, uh, the photographs in this book. Um, they are so unforgiving. They are. They're just. Well, that was the thing that I, I've written about that before, and and you know, I I tried it at, at first to review the movies in chronological order. You know, I, the plan was to start with. Um, Crossroads of Laredo from 1948 and go to a Hot Ice from 1978. That's 30 years. And I was going to, you know, do the movies in order. Well, the problem with that is that eventually it gets to be all, um, it just gets to be almost all the porno films, like back to back to back. And th that's a lot of, a lot of skin. Uh, and uh, you, you have to deal with like the, the, the peculiarities uh, of the human body. And I said that there are certain body parts that just cannot be filmed in a flattering way. They just, you just can't do it. Um, now, to, to, to their credit, I mean, Hugh Hefner's whole idea was, was to try to make the anatomy look like everything look as good as possible if he had to use lighting if he had to use uh, airbrushing whatever he needed to do he wanted to make it an, a physically you know you know appealing to the to the you know to make everything look as good as possible and that extended to everything in his brand he wanted to make you know if he did videos and things like that he wanted it all to look great and um and i guess russ meyer's films which don't get don't always get all that graphic, uh, although he got more graphic in his later years. They try he tries to make it look good, but um, in Ed's movies, it doesn't always look good. It does look like open heart surgery. It does. There was this restaurant in the Flint area uh, where they would film with they would film their ads with a videotape, you know, on videotape. And they would show the the dinners, you know, <laughs> the roast beef dinners, and they looked absolutely nauseating. It looked like it looked like surgical mistakes happening on the plate, you know. It just looked gross, and so we all had a good laugh over those. You know, they were cutting into the roast beef, and you're supposed to think like, "Oh wow, what great looking roast beef!" But it looked terrible. It looked like something from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre happening in front of you. There, it didn't look good. So. Um, that's what, I mean, I, I, I don't know, uh, if, if any of this, none of this looks appealing to me because like you have the cameras, like right, uh, practically right up people's asses. I'm sorry to have to be as graphic as that, but that's where the cameras are there. <laughs> and there's just certain things that you can't film and it. It's, it's very, very difficult to film them in a, um, in a visually appealing way. So like after a while, that's why I had to, 
to block that half of the book. And I wish that the, 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 the photographs weren't as frequent in Black Myth as they are, because it's just, it just is too anatomical uh, for me. And they get too close <laughs> in on the people. That's like, a... give them... Well, that was the point of the, you know, the whole thing. The text was just... Well, I guess that's why people were buying it. And you get some color photographs, too. Uh, I guess that should theoretically uh, help. Um, I mean, as, as I said before the call, you know, I have to give Bernie Bloom credit because, you know, compared to the, the earliest pornography I ever saw, at least these models are not repellent. Okay. They, they just look a little pale and thin to me they they look like lorraine newman types you know um we were talking about um what might have been going on in their lives and to me i said you know we were talking about it looked like they were living on reds vitamin c and cocaine like the song says and um not they're, getting they're a lot of sun not getting yeah they they look very pale um Maybe that's Although another reason why why I like the Russ Meyer films. He he always gets like the um, he gets healthier looking gals, uh, and he, of course he was uh, devastated when Erica Gavin lost a lot of weight, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it ruined her for him. Uh, but um, they they just look so pale, and everybody nobody looks like they're having fun in these pictures at all. Nobody looks like they're enjoying it. It just. It just looks like they're going through the motions, doing a job. Um, I that, guess that was, you know, that, for you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, Danny Peary, the, the cult film critic that I've been writing about too much in my blog lately, uh, I think he said it about Georgina Spelvin was that the, the key to Georgina Spelvin's career was that she always looked like she was having fun. And, um, and, Greg, you've written about uh, Ushi Daigard. Ushi always looks like uh, mm -hmm. Ushi always seems to be having yeah. a, a great time, seem seemingly. I um, think uh, well, on the subject of uh, not getting much sun, think about Alice Friedland's uh, has the most serious tan lines you will ever tans. see in the Young Marys. So she did actually get a little bit of sun. <laughs> well, yeah, I have Alice, a go ahead. <laughs> well, I have a seriously biased viewpoint on this, having having viewed so much vintage pornography that uh, I'm perhaps a nerd to it, you know, at this point. So it's hard for me to opine on that score. Know. One thing I did want to mention, though, yeah, the, the evolution from Crossroads of Laredo to Hot Ice, similar evolutions uh, takes place in the adult paperback market, where in the 1950s, the, the pulp paperbacks are starting to try to push the envelope of sexuality to the extent they can. Uh, and until the Supreme Court decision happens, I think it was the decision rooted in Naked Lunch, uh, William Burroughs Naked Lunch. Until right. that happened, you couldn't get really graphic. You could say up to that point, what would be considered an adult paperback was fairly quaint by today's standards, perhaps even G-rated. The game all changes, and by the mid-late 60s, you start to see more and more graphic language come into play. Certainly that evolves one step further. Once, uh, once hardcore pornography hits in terms of visual images that's going to push the the text to the side and force the text down the road jim talked about so in terms of putting ed in his place uh in the later years when he's writing for swedish erotica he's writing extremely anatomically in fact i think a lot of a lot of ed fans probably wouldn't even agree nor recognize that he wrote that work it's so different what he had written earlier then to jim's point we get the next evolution after ed's death of adult paperbacks where now they have to go into purely tr the most transgressive uh, uh, material you can possibly imagine just to subsist, to, to differentiate themselves from the, the explosion of hardcore pornography that happened uh, in the popular culture, in the mass culture during the 1970s. So then you get, I don't want to get into those topics necessarily, but you get things obviously like yes. bestiality, incest, etc. And uh, it gets quite... It, icky and it's not even that's a that's a dismissive way of putting it. it's really really know, positively I, I, disgusting how could it even be I remotely know, entertaining and, yeah and in, and as far you know since we're talking about black myth you you start to get your your slave era pornography yep. you get okay. con, you get well, concentration camp pornography i mean ed um, theoretically did some of that too uh some of it's been some some uh concentration camp stuff has been attributed to to ed 
Um, the one, uh, the one pictorial uh, pendulum Atlanta book, right? That's Nazi a, something. Nazi right? love slaves or something. Yeah. It's, that's a, and that was an, that was another one. That was another when I was drowning in Ed Wood. That was another one. Uh, I didn't have the version with the with pictures. Uh, I just had the text, and even with just the text, that was rough on me. I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a wuss. I, I'll, I'm a wuss here. I, you know, I I was like. Oh, geez, Louise, golly, gee, Moses, what are you doing here, Ed? This is, oh, God, this is gross. Okay, got to gotta continue, <laughs> got to read this thing. Um, Joe, Joe, you're not a wuss, you're regular, you're just not, you're just not corrupted well, and burnt out well, like some you know, other people on this I, call. I, the, the, <laughs> the movie, okay. I resemble okay. that remark, Jim. Yeah. Well, the movie that, the, the mm -hmm. movie that, that was the breaking, when I went to my initial phase of getting into Ed, the movie that almost broke me, and stop me was love feast and love feast is i think love feast isn't even hardcore love feast is a softcore film but for me at the time it got a big push from rhino like they were putting out you know, like they put out like bride of the monster and plan nine and and, and the mainstream stuff and they were like well can we also put out this thing and they put out uh, Love Feast under the title Pretty Models All in a Row. And at the time, you know, Ed crawling around and, you know, in his jockey shorts. Oh, jockey shorts is another term from this book. Uh, he, he overuses that one. He, there's too many references to jockey shorts in this. But we know that Ed does wear jockey shorts because I think he wears them in... Um, in Love Feast, but at that time, and I know I was not alone in this, um, Pretty Models in a row, All in a Row kind of broke people who, you know, uh, had, you know, they they watched Glenn or Glenda, Plan 9, Bride of the Monster, maybe Jailbait, um, Night of the Ghouls. Well, then are you ready to go on to the next step? And if the next step is Love Feast, a lot of people were like, nope, tapping out, can't do it. Yeah. Ed crawling around on the floor with the, the dog collar around his neck. No, nope. we've uh, since we've gone this far, I think it uh, it uh, begs the question, should we go one step further into what is perhaps the most controversial, controversial subject in all of Woodology? To your point, Joe, there are people who ascribe to the canonical Ed Wood the, the worst filmmaker of all time, the goofy guy who made Glenn uh, or Glenda Plan 9 from Outer Space, etc., and who ascribed to, could we call it a myth? I'm not going to say that right now, but could we call Ed's uh, Ed being a straight transvestite? Could we consider that a myth? That's a subject which, if you bring it up with certain people that we okay. know, they're, they're very uh, beholden to the idea that that's 100% true. Of course, Ed, Ed well, could never have been a bisexual. That actually comes up here at, in the last chapter, Black yes. Man, White Man, or White Man, yeah, Black okay. Man, whatever it is. It comes up here no. in Black Myth. Right. It raises its head when we have the appearance of Shirley. We finally um, get Shirley. Uh, <laughs> Shirley, a transvestite. You know, yes, in Black Shirley, Man. Shirley meets Bobby, who's described as the young gay Black man. And Shirley guides Bobby's hand up under her skirt to let him feel, quote, a great set of balls and a penis on a, almost as large as his own, unquote. Yeah. And then Shirley invites Bobby back to his place for a, a better look at Shirley's equipage. Now, call me weird and cynical, but I don't know what planet that occurs on where there aren't subsequent activities between the two individuals um right. and you uh, know and 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 like you say greg there's this in the same way joe that there are people you know there's people don't the edward movie is, is in a way a perfect exemplar of this right it cuts yeah. his life short at this per very specific point in time oh. And we don't get to see this whole other arc that but, that Ed was on. Well, well, well I, I, I want to say as you bring that up now, if I don't know who's watching this at this point, but uh, <laughs> now, um, now is the time to do Ed Wood too, the 1970s uh, Ed, because if you've seen Johnny Depp lately, 
he looks like Ed Wood in the 70s. He looks like, you know, <laughs> this is the time to do it. Um, so I don't think you could get Tim Burton. I don't know. Tim Burton might not be right for this material anymore. <laughs> but um, now is the time to do the second half of the Ed Wood story. Uh, you know, and, and I noticed how, like, even when, when, uh, in the 70s, would uh, Ed would wear his hair longer. He would have kind of long, sort of greasy looking hair that went down to maybe about his shoulders. Well, Johnny's wearing his hair kind of similar to that style right now. Johnny would be perfect for it now. And uh, I, don't, I don't think this one would be underwritten by uh, a Disney. This is, this is one that Disney's not going to want to have anything to do with. <laughs> but um, if, if, if he's still out there and wants to do it, I think now is the time because, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I tried, I tried thinking about that. Like, um, how John do you, how, John, what, well, I mean, how do you turn that though into a, into like a three act story? Like, you know, the first film is about, you know, Ed getting to make his movie, uh, becoming friends with uh, Bella Lugosi. And then, um, you know, making a film after Bella, you know, how does he continue on after Bella? And that's the, you know, the, the rise, fall, rise structure. Well, how do you get that in the second half of his career? And I thought the only way is you start out with Ed as an alcoholic a writer who's desperately wanting to get back into making films however he can. And the thing is that, you know, the type of film that he gets to make is pornography. So he, you know, the story is you're rooting for Ed to get back into movies, however he can do it. And even if it has to be pornography, it has to be pornography. So um, I, the portion about Shirley at the end of the book is, I think, that the payoff that Ed Wood fans have been waiting for for over 180, 100 and something, it's like 70 or 80 pages into the book at that point. Um, it's the payoff that you wanted. We don't actually get, very disappointingly to me, we don't actually get any Angora. He doesn't literally mention Angora. I think he might mention fur. Frilly, frilly. Frilly, just, frilly. Yeah. Okay, he likes lace and he likes satin and silk, but uh, we don't get, uh, we don't actually get Angora. But we do get this passage here. Uh, a gay bar wasn't hard to come by. In Los Angeles, there are such bars on nearly every corner. Fruit bars, gay joints, drag bars, homo havens, pansy pots. The names increase with whomever comes along with another. Which, what the hell oh, does that mean? If you keep going there, Joe, that's one of your favorite uh, Woody and oh, notions. beer bar. The, the beer bar. <laughs> exactly. The beer, the bar, beer bar, yes. And the beer oh, bar and the is other, exclusively oh. a homosexual bar. Yeah. And somewhere in there, I don't know if it's in that paragraph, uh, Yep, yep, yep. Down at the bottom, uh, uh, Nelly type boys. Oh my god! But there were several <laughs> girls, and they, they were being attended by the boys. Nelly type of boys. John Waters is one of the only people I've ever known to use the word Nelly. He uses it too. Nelly types of boys with a touch of makeup and perhaps dyed hair, as well as the Levi crowd. Now, if you've read any of Ed's books about gangs or juvenile delinquents or hippies or whatever Ed thinks young people are doing. Levi's are paramount in his imagination. Uh, uh, Levi's are always a sign of bad things. Anybody who's wearing Levi's, Ed was so anti-Levi's. I'm not sure why, why he had this. Um, I guess I, I've never seen Ed wearing jeans or anything like that. I, I don't think I've ever seen Ed wearing denim. Um, I don't know. It, it, do, do, but he always thinks of it as like, oh, if you if you're wearing Levi's, you're a subversive, a hippie, a radical. You know, it's always bad news when you wear Levi's. Now, well, you know, when Ed was growing up, let's see, the only people wearing jeans would have been, certain, I mean, some blue collar workers. Blue collar, yeah. The Navy used to wear that kind of material. Right. Low grade seamen. Um, and it was really after, no pun intended. <laughs> That's an Ed Wood title. That's an Ed Wood book title, Low Grade Seaman by Ed Wood. It, it, it's literally with, you know, after the Second World War, it, it is 
the veterans coming back and forming biker gangs that adopt right. that as clothing okay. that breaks it out into the larger um, culture. So certainly right. from when, when Ed was in, in the same way that if you go back to that same time period, if, if you were former military and you had a tattoo, that was probably an indicator to most people that you came from an untouchable class in life. You know, there are certain indicators of, you know, being outside the respectable community. And if there is one thing, if there's one thing I never would have predicted in my lifestyle, in, in my lifetime, it is the rise in acceptability of tattoos and the ubiquity of tattoos. Uh, I was just in a meeting at work today. We were in a very bland office meeting room and like, just about everybody in the room, except me, uh, is inked up like to a pretty great extent. And I, I that would have blown Ed Wood's mind because uh, I I was from that era when I grew up in an era when, yeah, you either were former military, former prison, or, you know, into like gang stuff. You know, uh, I had an uncle who had I had an uncle who had a, like a one of those bi girls that you put on your biceps so that when you, you know, I, I don't know what you call that, hoochie coochie girl or whatever. <laughs> and he was always considered, you know, like one of the my wilder uncles, you know, the more disreputable of my uncles. So, um, and, you know, the idea that he had this um, hoochie coochie girl that he could flex on his arm, and make her, you know. That's interesting. Here, like my, she's doing that. My, my maternal grandfather had a had a little naked lady tattoo on his forearm, and he was uh, uh, in the Pacific in World War II in the Navy. Interestingly enough, the, going back to the denim real quick, Jim, you got like the wild ones, right? So you've got the, the right. thugs, the gangs right. who are going to pillage the town. You know, Marlon Brando popularizing the denim. Even think of James Dean, probably even more so in Rebel Without a Cause, popularizing sure. denim. Nice. You know. Yeah. It's got the blue jeans. Uh, I think uh, to your point a few minutes ago, Joe, how many people are slogging through this with us at this point? We could go on at great length as we have already, and we could probably <laughs> go a lot. We could probably go a lot deeper. We could actually spend could actually... extend the expend the whole night actually talking about this because there's a lot we haven't even begun to <laughs> yeah. touch on. Maybe we'll revisit this subject if uh, it's a subject that's of any any significant any interest. interest. I do think it's it's uh, going to be uh, almost exclusively for the for the more serious uh, hardcore Ed Wood fan, the casual with Ed Wood yeah. fan, if they were to read Black Myth, uh, they, they would have okay. little interest, be disgusted, well, perhaps be offended, and uh, not want to really associate their version of Ed Wood with a book like this. Well, we can come to a conclusion, though. Should Ed Wood fans read Black Myth if they have the opportunity to do so? Jim, what, what do you think? Should, should, should a fan... Or should only certain so fans? I, 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 well, no, I would, I would, you know, certainly they should, they should take a shot at it if they have the chance. You know, I've always been, I'm very non-judgmental when it comes to Ed. His life, his right. life was a was an interesting arc. It had all sorts of ups and downs. You know, to the point of making an Ed Wood two. I don't know how that would be anything other than something like Boogie Nights, which for all well, the comedy in it is a profoundly depressing and sad tale of the destruction that's, of people's lives and like that's the kind of movie i wanted to make kid ourselves with the ed with the end of ed's life was like which is true for a lot right. of people, you know it was not right. a happy tale and to make it a happy so you know i've never shied away from i've, I've never looked away from ed's later years in fact i've found them profoundly interesting because so many people want to look away from it and want to deny right. it um, and, and in a way that's almost like not respectful to Ed. I mean, on the one hand, how, you know, if anyone's taking, if anyone's making any serious commentary about his movies, like Glenn or Glenda and the celebration of the individual over it, well, how can you do that? And then, and then deny, you know, the reality of his life and what he went through, you know, that to me, that's just sort of disrespectful for him. I, I really agree, Jim. I think that uh, you have to, if you're going to pursue this book, uh, or if you uh, 
would want to read this book if you were a, a serious Ed Wood fan. You got to ask yourself one question: Do I want to really come to a full reckoning of Ed from uh, A to Z throughout the the, the you yeah. know the larger path and scope of his life? If not, if you want to preserve a, a, a notion of Ed Wood in your mind that uh, you, you like Plan Nine, you like Bride of the Monster, etc., right. probably stay the hell away from something like this, uh, so it doesn't right. infect infect what what you like about ed wood so uh tread lightly tread lightly going into the later paperbacks generally i would say but this one in particular there's there is two uh, i want to revisit the controversial notion just make a couple additional points but i also wanted to mention really quickly plug a recent article of joe's where he talked about uh on the first page here in black myth on the first page of the introduction we get a quote it's oh, not yeah. ascribed to anybody but it mentions it's the science of mind quote i'm paraphrasing but uh anything yeah. you can conceive you can achieve this is a very common notion tony robbins yeah. will parrot yeah, the same kind of notion it's everywhere and uh it was rob huffman actually who pointed out a number of these things to me about ernest uh, holmes's science of mind which was really a prominent church right. during that time frame and uh as, as you noted uh could that be you know where ed and kathy met i mean he had he had two thousand three thousand seat auditoriums where he was speaking on sundays right. yeah i i was very surprised ever after having uh recently written an article about the Church of Religious Science and Ed's interest in it uh, in the 1950s uh, to get a reference to it uh, in the introduction. I think he did, he, I, I don't know if it's even chapter one. I, th I think it's like- some, It's in the intro, it's on page one. It's in the, int the intro. intro, page yeah, one. So like he doesn't Literally two wait, paragraphs in, yeah. He doesn't wait to get to this material. So, um, and I've talked about why I think this material would appeal to him. I, I think, in some ways, you know, to to have the kind of life that Ed had, you have to uh, have some kind of ambition and some kind of self-deception. You have to keep kind of telling your, you know, you have to keep kind of giving yourself uh, pep talks, you know, and 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 feel like you're you're still you're still in this. This is still something that could could happen for me. So, um, in in a way, it's touching to me that. Um, as early as late as the 1970s, he's still uh, quoting this material because I think it shows that, um, you know, he hadn't given up. He hadn't given up hope yet, I think. Um, so that that spark of optimism that you see in, in the first Ed Wood movie, the Tim Burton film, it wasn't completely extinguished. So, um, you know, uh, that's why I was, I was, I was, happily i was happy happily surprised to see that material quoted so he didn't give up on it he didn't forget about it um whether in this material you know whether it's real or or not um it's been peddled in a lot of ways um i vaguely remember that uh, like criswell when he was publishing uh he was trying to get books published you know like those how to crash tin pan alley and how to crash into Broadway and all that stuff. Like, if there's an ad for a uh, one of these uh, for this book that he he didn't write himself, but he's promoting it about positive thinking, the power of you know imagining you know what you want and visualizing it and blah blah blah. And that book, whatever it is, I've forgotten the title of it. It's easily available. It's public domain now. It's on archive.org and stuff like that. But you know, in more recent years, it's been repackaged as like the secret, you know, and things like that. So. Um, it's it's hokum, I think most people have come to the conclusion that that it's hokum, but I don't know. It's I think it's basically harmless hokum, and I, I think if you're living in Yucca Flats and writing Black Myth on a typewriter before you pawn it to buy Imperial, you know, uh, you got to have some hope. And if that if that you know visualize what you want and blah blah blah, if you can believe it you can achieve it if that helps if that helps you get through yeah. the day good good i remember uh, i remember one this is about 10 years ago i was watching an episode uh somehow just uh got on my radar an episode of the the biggest loser 
you know, one of those okay. stupid reality shows where uh, they're really uh, exploiting uh, overweight people. And <laughs> I'm pissing a lot of people off here as this goes deeper. So while I'm at it, while I'm at it, somebody's at the end of the episode's holding up a, a sign in the crowd, believe and achieve, believe and achieve. So that's the <laughs> notion we're talking about here. Yeah. It's very, it's attractive, right? It is, I think, to Joe's point, yeah. relatively harmless notion, uh, unless, and I'll piss a few more people off, unless you uh, are a Scientologist, perhaps. Perhaps uh, I'm not going to go oh down boy. that road. I'm wouldn't not going to go. I'm not going to go been, down off that tangent. Wouldn't it have been interesting to hear what Ed thought of Scientology? Um, well, that's another subject he, for another he day. Had, he had, you know, it's a shame he if he maybe if he had gotten hooked up with the church early enough, he could have been the Tom Cruise of his day. Yeah, uh, but you yeah. know, uh, but well, along these lines, you know, I'm always reminded of uh, one of my favorite quotes by Robert Anton Wilson. Who, oh, who I also a, recently wrote about, yeah. Really widely published writer, and, and um, I don't, I don't know if he ever published this quote, but I heard it in a talk he gave in 1986 in Boulder, Colorado, and that quote was, "We live in our myths; we only tolerate reality." <laughs> well, I just, I, I just wrote an article about his book. Uh, reality is what you can get away with, um, okay. which actually mentions ed so that was part of my uh advent calendar and uh if people haven't uh, done this uh there are speeches and talks by robert and wilson that you can find on uh youtube um do yourself a favor and and uh watch some of that material uh read whatever books of his that you can uh, locate out there uh you won't regret it um I always say he's, he's kind of a combination of Einstein and Groucho Marx. And, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, and so it's not a despair. Wilson doesn't have a, a despairing philosophy. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. So, um, but he's also kind of more, uh, you know, there's a little bit, he has more of a wise guy sensibility to it. It's, it's hard to, I don't want to butcher his words or his ideas. I would just say, uh, go seek out the man yourself. Uh, he's passed away, but his uh, interviews and books and things like that live on. So um, he, he was a hilarious, hilarious public speaker. I went to a number of his his talks uh, in the 80s. And uh, that one in Boulder in particular was quite funny because it was at a Unitarian church. And there were a bunch of evangelicals outside protesting that he was demonic and handing out <laughs> literature to everyone going into the church for the talk. And after we got all in there and assembled in the church, you know, he uh, he was up at the podium and, and he yelled out, you know, jokingly as if there was somebody in the back asking if everybody was inside. OK, lock the doors now that we've got them in here, you know. <laughs> um, well, but uh, yeah, he, he was uh, plenty of uh, there's plenty of YouTube videos. You can hear the man speak for himself. And he was quite. Uh, Quite erudite and quite hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think uh, I want to say one last thing, and then I think uh, that the Wilson quote that you cited, Jim, actually is a good segue into sort of doing a, a quick wrap up here. So we'll go around the horn. Uh, my last thought on that, the myth and, myth and reality, the notion of myth and reality, the actual last uh, uh, couple sentences of the epilogue here in Black Myth is, if this book has given a few clarities to myths and legends, then it has all been worthwhile because it was not written to condone or, or to condemn or condone, but to lay out the facts as they could be traced down. Again, we're getting into some Glenn or Glenda sort of uh, uh, right. language there to a degree. The condone and condemn actually you'll find in tons of uh, editorials in the in the Pendulum slash Calga magazines. Uh, the same same exact verbiage, condone and condemn. There's other instances throughout this book where there's woodisms. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, we cited a few of them along the way. I do want to touch back on the notion of myth. So Ed, Ed's uh, core myth, perhaps, is uh, fighting in the military, fighting in battle, and being a war hero. Jim, uh, if you haven't read it, yeah, Jim, you need to yeah. read The Unknown War of Edward D. Wood Jr. by James Pontalillo. It is a myth, one of the myth bust, the best myth busting book in, in the Edward space. There's no doubt about it. And if you still ascribe to that myth, read that book and it will absolutely convince you otherwise. Again, the other, the other myth, the notion, and again, this one gets into more controversial, equally controversial territory, if not more so with some people, the notion 
question of his uh, potential bisexuality. I'm not going to get into detail on that right now, but uh, have it on good authority that uh, there's some credence to that bisexuality in the text themselves, as we bore out here in that Shirley yeah. scene at the end of Black Myth, I think sort of makes you makes you scratch your head. Also consider Ed wrote for Pendulum uh, published a lot of their theme magazines were uh, gay hey, yeah. male magazines many of them gay yeah. studs etc and if you read those there's about i have about 35 issues and uh those particular magazines it's all other magazines you know maybe uh charles anderson writes an article and ed writes an article and leo eaton and puts something in the in the gay magazines it is spot on unmistakably 100 percent ed wood in nearly all of those magazines and it presents yeah. especially in the pictorial texts there's a few articles actually back in the day at edward wednesdays that cite some of this um in the pictorial text he presents a very idealistic vision of uh of, of gay male sex without a doubt so i'm just throwing that out there i'm not trying to convince anybody to change their mind on that score but again if you're looking to fully reckon with ed wood um, then I think you need to, you know, seriously consider all the inputs and all the data that's available. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, uh, um, you guys, whoever wants to go first, uh, let, if you can, uh, kind of give us some last thoughts, <laughs> even though we have uh, lots more to say, I think we should, uh, uh, yeah. kind of bring this one to a close for now. Go ahead, Joe. Well, I will say that the thing that makes Ed Wood a worthwhile subject is that there is so much material to cover and so many facets to his personality and black myth is one little part of that sort of periodic table of ed wood basically you know you're just taking one little uh, uh you know a tile out of that periodic table and if you're going to understand the the man holistically you, you'll need pieces like this. So if you only want to stick to the ones up here, you can do it. Uh, I did, and I emerged, I hope, uh, a wiser person uh, for the experience. And I thank you, by the way, uh, for scanning this uh, book. Absolutely. So uh, that's that's incredible. Um, yeah, thank you for doing that, Jim. This is this was quite a find. Yeah, no, no problem. I think, you know, my last thought on on Ed in this book would just be, as we've discussed, given the, given the arc his life took, his, his writing can be quite different from book to book, depending on what yeah. his personal circumstances were and the demons he may have been wrestling at any given point in time, especially the demon named Imperial Whiskey. <laughs> um, so I, I try to, especially some of his, what some my people might think of as some of his more aberrant or out there works, I always try to keep that in context and uh and and you know and despite whatever content black myth may have yet interestingly enough when you do a deep dive even on this you find these little pearls scattered in there that are telling us other things about ed or confirming you know little things we had heard about from other sources uh but personal interests, whatnot. So it, it's just sort of that, that was the thing I think that was most surprising for me with this book was um, that even in a text like this, that is so problematic in many ways, there's still all sorts of other very interesting little, little lights being cast on him. Indeed. That's a good wrap, uh, gentlemen. Uh, aberrant and uh, problematic is, uh, I think, uh, spot on and uh pearls found many yeah you guys found many pearls here and so i learned a whole heck of a lot talking this through with you and uh, i'm really grateful that you guys uh accepted my proposal to go down uh, a rather uh rather challenging road and i hope for those yeah. of you who uh made it this far and made it all the way through uh if you're still with us i hope you did i found this fun to a degree yeah. chatting with my friends about sort Ed Wood. Of. I use that term advisedly, though, because of the subject matter. At the same time, I do hope you found this uh, in some way informative, perhaps even beneficial. And uh, join us back here again. I'm sure the three of us will be back to talk at some point. I'll certainly be back here at the Edward mm -hmm. Summit podcast, and uh, I, I would love to have these guys certainly join me at some point in the future. And I think what I'd like to do uh, as a little preview, uh, it would be really cool, guys. I know I mentioned this to you privately, but uh, we have a few uh, very... Uh, likely suspects of uh, 
unknown paperbacks that uh, we're we're yeah. fairly confident that were written by Ed Wood that you probably have. I would be confident actually that you have not heard about as yet. So uh, perhaps we'll be back in the near future to reveal yet another Ed Wood book to uh, put on on your bucket list. So thank you, everybody. Have a great night or day, right. whatever time of day it is there. Bye. Right.